Good evening. Everywhere I go on this island, it seems to me I find a generous in. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. <laughs> See, it's a lot scarier when there's no motive, Sid. We have a bargain. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. Do you feel the pain? Always be young. His entire work consists of violence, all the time obsessed with the issue of violence. Mayhem, gouging out of eyes, autopsies on the stage. Come. It is time to keep your appointment. Or oh, don't you just love the feeling of zero seats. Can't you smell it in the air? You can feel it, can't you, chat? Welcome to Double Feature Horror Show episode 143, a number considerably larger than zero. Um, I see people are getting hit with the ads. Bless you. Uh, that is unfortunate. Two unskippable ads. I feel your pain, guys, but also I, I hear the distant sound of a little bit of, little bit of YouTube bucks coming my way. So, you know, Swings and roundabouts. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we have a really fun one. We are rounding off our John Carpenter arc with Prince of Darkness. I've got a fantastic guest that I'm really happy to talk to and get a, to have a chance to have a nice uh, extended conversation with. Uh, I love it when people come and request a horror movie. Uh, I think it's you always get a good conversation out of that. And this is a really interesting one. Before we get into that, if you are new to this, if you uh, haven't seen what we do before on this, we have a little topic section and then we go into a long discussion of a fantastic movie. And when I say a little topic section, I am lying. I will yammer on about Vincent Price for quite a while, but I hope you'll be forgiving. Um, let's see. Uh, but be before I yammer on, I'm going to try and be good, folks. 40 minutes. I managed it last time. I'm going to manage it today. 40 minutes on Vincent Price. And the wonderful people who are politely suffering through <laughs> my slight obsessions uh, are, of course, Stelios. Good to see you, man. Hello, Chloe. And hello, TCG. Nice to be here. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, we... Um, we ran into each other in your, in your office. Uh, I obviously am a Lotus Eaters appreciator. Um, and when you mentioned you had an interest in horror, I'd, fantastic. You know, I it was great to talk about that. And you had some really good requests. I remember when you were in the office and I've started talking about books and some particular authors who write horror fiction. And I was talking to you about Adam Neville, one of the... English authors of horror who has written really good novels and you said that you were uh, a fan of uh, horror movies and we started talking about it and I'm sure we're going to have a lovely discussion. Oh yes, oh, yeah I remember, I'm, I'm terrible on reading honestly, it's uh, <laughs> I've got such a long film list that I, I'm really bad at actually reading horror novels so it's like some okay. Poe, some Lovecraft, I'll I'll manage that, but no, otherwise I'm I'm quite weak. So Adam Neville, um, if people are interested in it, what, what would you say is the sort of vibe of Adam Neville? Well, he has a distinctive focus on paganism mm. and where, for instance, you would see stories with ghost hauntings and stuff. He would have, for instance, stories with bad neighbors who are pagans and are invoking spirits, casting curses and stuff. It's uh, very interesting, and especially when it comes to the horror genre, you know, a lot of it it's Stephen King based. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to find every now and then some really new authors who are giving a distinctive feel. And I think Adam Neville has a distinctively British feel for some reason. If he's doing pagan stuff, it sounds like he's possibly going to be quite cool quite soon. Yeah, I mean, pagan horror is is pretty it's picking up at the moment or it's been picking up in the last decade at yes. least yeah at um of course as well as stelios we are joined by that cooper guy agent good cooper. evening good evening how are you doing good evening stelios good evening chat good evening. 
Welcome back, TCG. I hope all is well with you. Yeah, it's been a busy week. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Look, the behind the scenes stuff, my goodness, yes, it, it definitely has been busy. Not not just real life stuff. You've you've also been uh, back in court, haven't you? I've been back in court. Yeah. Oh God. The streams. <laughs> oh right. Yes. 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 Oh Jesus Christ! I thought we had something lined up then. I thought, I thought you were going to make some like sick P Diddy joke or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course, not. of course. Not. Would would I? Would I? No, I did no, forget to introduce you with the lyrics from um, "I'll Be Missing You," though. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, poor timing, poor timing. But no, you're absolutely right. I've been back in the courts playing some Ace Attorney. Um, <clears throat> we did a stream on Wednesday night and and one on Saturday, I think it was. Um, we'll, we'll be back on it tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, oh my God, what, what a week. Um, I'll be doing, I was doing testing for work for, for the guys who don't know in the chat uh, at my job. And I was expected to last uh, for, for its last one hour. Uh, and this was on Monday night, and it ended up lasting five and a half hours. So I didn't f actually clock off until half two in the morning. And then I had to be up again at half five. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm supposed to be streaming tonight. Uh, we'll push it back to Wednesday. And then they were like, oh, no, we might need you on Wednesday evening. And then I was like, um, I have to push it back to Friday. And then they said, no, we don't need you anymore. So I was like, okay, fine. I have no idea how you function, man. Oh, you, I don't know. You copious, are, you are... <laughs> co copious amounts of Pepsi and Paracetamol. That'll do. That'll do. That that's quite an interesting. Uh, that's quite an interesting combo um, to relax with. You know, I I tried something special this week, um, which I thought you might be interested in. I I thought I'd treat myself for this stream. Get something we might all enjoy. Um, I I I tried this. I tried Snoop Dogg's wine. Have, have you tried tried any Snoop Dogg wine? I can't say that I have. I don't really drink these days, do I? Oh, well, I I thought I haven't I, tried it either. Yeah, no, no, Mister GB, it was not Mellow Birds. I branched out. I thought I'd I'd support the um, you know, the um, underprivileged communities and get a bit of Kelvin Brodus's wonderful rose I mean, wine. To to be fair, Snoop Dogg can get quite mellow. He does. He's <laughs> he's generally quite a relaxed guy. Yeah, mm. I got it for the meme. Um, I thought it'd be funny. I'm afraid it was absolute pish i am um, <laughs> it tasted like rye rye beaner i just got the vibe like this was something that freshers were meant to get smashed on um i thoroughly regret my life choices oh you you, you missed it. you dropped the ball there you could have called it pizzizzle oh. wasn't that good if only if, not even for the meme i was but uh i wish they'd call it like snoop doc but uh I mean, for any uh, wine appreciators in there, I was trying to come up with more rapper based wine jokes, but uh, it, it's hard to do those. It, it's it's very hard to do for me anyway. Um, let's see. In in other news, uh, just we'll get the news out of the way, then we'll uh, talk a bit further. I just do, do need to say uh, people have been enjoying the blockbuster series. We started uh, debuting that last week. There was a part one was released on Friday, part two on Saturday. And you got the two commentaries for Fright Night and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. So thank you to everyone who's enjoyed those. Uh, I had a request that for this week's, we'll, we'll put them out on Saturday again. But um, I had a request to do this week's commentary live. I'm intrigued. It's a commentary for The Shining. So that is a bit of a beast to be there for because we're doing the, it's the American version. So, uh, you know, that's two hours 23. It's longer than the European cut, but I'll give it a go. If people like it, then uh, we might try it again, but be ready on Saturday. I think we'll do the Shining commentary live. And let's see, we also had... Um, the first part of the Stanley Kubrick series with Lotus Eaters is now out. Uh, we have filmed part two uh, in order to be able to go into full excessive detail. It needs to see a bit of love. So make sure you go there, show that some support. Um, and if you're curious, highly recommend it. 
you know, get, get yourself the five pounds membership and enjoy uh, the now. God, how many is it? Four, four things I've done. If you you get a lot of proper horror show for your money, as well as all the other excellent content. Um, I, I've stayed us. I really enjoyed you and Josh talking about modern manners. Uh, yes, that was a good one. And uh, people <laughs> said that they found it unexpectedly funny. Well, yeah, I uh, I saw the clip from it and I was like, oh, I I need to see the full one. <laughs> yeah, that that's a true story. It it actually happened and it was hilarious. Oh, right. Yeah, highly recommended. I mean, folks, you, they're doing good stuff. Show, show a bit of support. And the final bit of news, um, after a long struggle, like literally this happened in January, um, the Scream 6 video is back. It is unlocked. It is unbanned. And it is available again. So if you were thinking, I really fancy a sort of Mauler length deep dive into an absolutely abysmal disaster of a movie um it's back again you can find it check it out on my channel uh it is the two hours and 40 minute dissection and evisceration of scream six so i'm so pleased that is back um so you you have a lot of content now i'm yammering um i will simply say uh my guest links are in the description you know where they are. You can support them, and I highly uh, recommend it. And if you want to support this channel, uh, you can do so via Super Chats. You can do so via memberships either here or on Subscribestar. And you get all the uh, wonderful benefits, uh, early access stuff, and so on. Uh, you know that already now. I've gone on quite long enough here. So, um, Stelios, as it is your first appearance, something I always like to do uh, for people's debuts is just ask them a, a little bit about how they feel about horror, why why they would uh, turn up on a fairly unusual horror channel to uh, to talk about it in, in in depth. Well, I loved horror from an early age because it terrified me, and I felt I had to somehow do something about it. And uh, in the beginning, I I always was very afraid of walking in places where there was no light. <laughs> And I just said, this is unacceptable. I really have to do something about it. So I went full on. I said, I want to just explore the whole genre and stop being afraid. And uh, I did just that. And I've, I've loved horror ever since. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the movies I watch every now and then are horror movies. And I absolutely adore it. So I you think are, you are more movie... than a casual fan. You are actually like, this is one of your go-to genres. Yes, I think it gives us a very interesting way of dealing with the feelings we have of anxiety and horror by just creating a barrier between ourselves and the screen and the horrors of life. We can start thinking about them and we can actually be very present. That's what horror does for me. It, If I watch a movie that is two hours, it's two hours that I'm going to be watching the movie. I'm not going to be on my phone my attention is not going to be diverted. I'm going to be absolutely present. Now, I don't know what this show is about me, but that's <laughs> what it is. I think that the horror genre has an absolutely powerful way of making us present and mm. into the moment. You're, we live in the moment. I think, yeah, I'd agree. It, it's a... I mean, like you, I got into it very young. Like my earliest memories, like are watching Aliens at nine, The Omen at about nine. Uh, that was the first film I ever owned. Um, and I think I, f I found there was an intensity with horror movies that I didn't have in anything else. And I always enjoyed that intensity of a scare, even when it was in another genre. Um, yeah, yeah. Would you say, do you find yourself, you're sort of drawn to sort of more extreme experiences sort of outside of horror as well? I wouldn't say so. And with horror also, I would say that I draw a distinction be between a horror that has to do with people. That terrifies me. I wouldn't call it mm. horror. I would call it terror. But when it comes to spirits, demons and stuff like that, just I'm all in. Yeah. And would you say I that there's a correlation? Sorry. Would you say there's a? I would say. Would you say there's a correlation between people who enjoy horror and uh, 
and get into politics, given that politics, especially these days, is incredibly like <laughs> torturous and and just horrific and you know I absolutely know absorbing if, on the soul. <laughs> I don't know if there is a correlation, but I will say that my my love for the horror genre makes me have a much stronger stomach to mm. deal with a lot of the stuff that I'm dealing with every day when I'm doing uh, political commentary. Amen. It's mm. sort of like I accept that it has always been the case. It is the case and it will always be the case that a lot of horrific things will happen. That's how I can maintain a sort of sanity and not get completely emotionally destroyed when I see really bad news that I see some other people um, have that reaction when they do so. And I think that my love for the horror genre helps me in that respect. Mm. I, I think I was get, kind of getting from what you're saying that horror almost trains you to have a healthy way of engaging with something very extreme, very terrifying, but also having a healthy barrier which is probably quite so. useful. Yeah. I, I don't yeah, know about you. I, I managed to be able to to just say, I, I could watch absolutely a sort of brutal stuff and I could always tell myself, oh, yeah, it's a movie. And I could be engaged whilst also not being very affected by it. Yes. Yeah. It's a healthy skill. So what are some of those, Um, what are some specific films that, I, that you would say sort of, really captured your uh, your interest and what well, was it about them so i think that uh, generally speaking a lot of the movies that carpenter has made are brilliant and have huge rewatchability for for reasons that we are going to we are going to talk about in the later on in this discussion but i would say that i i really like also the the old shining the stanley kubrick uh, version nice because i've also read the book and i know that stephen king didn't like it but i i like both both the book and the movie they were sort of different things and oh you're uh, a I very think, rare person <laughs> yeah i think he was a bit unfair with um with the criticism that mm. he made of it he said something like the book was about alcoholism and it was but it, the movie didn't exactly show Jack Torrance as a non-alcoholic. Just, you know, my my, my view. Mm. Yeah, the King has had some very mixed feelings of the film over the years. And I, th I think mostly because he just thought his big reaction, I think, was that it just wasn't his story, that it, yeah. it had sort of the trappings of it. It had the visuals, but it was in its heart. It's a totally different story. Uh, with a totally different motivation. I don't know if he was a bit precious about it, but still, the movie is, is really great. I think uh, Kubrick did a very good job. I'm very glad to hear it. And uh, yeah, I, I know some of the some of the films you've uh, requested uh, to be reserved. I'm very happy to reserve. Actually, yep. one of them, I, th I think we can say, uh, you requested the S Suspiria remake. And yes. I know there's quite a few people who are regulars here who really didn't like it. Um, actually, some guests who really didn't like it. So uh, I, I've been in the minority thinking that that, that was absolutely brilliant. I loved that film. Um, so w when we get to cover that, I think we might have a, a tough time, but hopefully we can yeah. win people over into uh, loving both the original and uh, and the new one. May I add something before we go on? Just so about a movie. I just uh, speaking of Suspiria, I really like the old uh, Creepers of Dario Argento. Mm. I think the movie he did just a bit before the old Suspiria. Maybe mm -hmm. it was a bit after, but it's the one with Jennifer Connelly and, and Donald Pleasance, who's also on Prince of Darkness. Oh, um, which is that? Um, I'm quite weak on Argento. I've only seen a few of his. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't remember. Um, I think it was called uh, Creepers. Creepers. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I've even heard of that. That's a nice uh, movie to watch. Nice. And uh, the, I, 
I'd also say I, th I think there's a little bit of an Argento uh, influence in this. In one particular scene, I think they took his yes. style. Yes. I wonder if we're thinking of the same scene. We'll we'll get yep. to it. We'll get to it. Um, but yes, I think right. we are. I think we are. But I'll, I'll stay silent. Okay. All right. And chat if you've got it in mind. We'll see. Um, okay. Well, we should. Uh, to, we try and do these in about two and a half hours. So uh, I maybe let's move on to the topic section. I will try and do that in 40 minutes. Uh, and just before we get into that um, chat, by the way, good to see so many of the familiar faces. And also, if you're watching this on the rewatch, hello. I actually remembered you for once. Apologies. I forget pretty much every week, but hi. And for whoever is hearing this, uh, you know how YouTube works. Do give the stream a like. Otherwise, uh, it gets uh, chucked in the basement and no one gets to see it. And that makes me very, very sad. All right. Um, so we will now move on to the topic section. We're looking at a slice of price, part five. <laughs> and bless you, if you came to see a uh, stream about Prince of Darkness, we're going to get to it. Honestly, we will. We will get to it. And maybe I will remember chapters this week. But anyway, uh, we're on part five of our Vincent Price biography, and we're finally getting into the section that I think people are a bit more familiar with. Um, Stelios, I think if you if I ask you about Vincent Price, um, do you have familiarity with him? Are you um, have you seen any of his stuff? Uh, not much, but was he involved in Plan Nine from Outer Space? Thankfully, not. Okay. I had to I had to review that and uh Okay, okay. Mr. No, I'm Gently Benevolent uh, made familiar. me review it. <laughs> I'm not familiar, so I'll just enjoy the presentation. Well, he, he said something a little bit like you said that we will uh we will get to cover. He had a, a sort of perspective on horror that I think uh, might sound a bit familiar to you. Um so uh we're covering basically his most famous period of work. Um, basically, when people think of Vincent Price, they are probably thinking of the films we're covering now. And we've done four parts building up to this. Uh, last one was really the only part uh, where we started to see him actually do uh, engagement with the horror universe. He was working with a chap called William Castle, um, who was a fantastic salesman. He always had a gimmick for every film. And his work with Price was so successful, they were absolutely pumping out the movies. He did four movies in 1959. He was absolutely prolific. And I think that density of them, that concentration of him in horror roles, is why we started thinking Vincent Price is the horror guy. When previously we've been trying to show him uh, doing so much more, a whole load of other stuff, um, including his sort of focus in the ad. Uh, in the um, art world, that's his. That's his uh, other focus. But we'll also, we'll have a little contrast here, just just for your um, education. We've been doing this a while, um, and Vincent, when we're starting to cover him, him here is in his late forties. Um, I've got a contrast with him in his early days in cinema in the nineteen thirties, and now on the right is him in a fantastic advert for Smirnoff Vodka from 1957 or 1955. Many disagreements over that, but a lovely little advert by Bert Stern. And I think that shows a bit of a artistic touch that he would approve of. Um, you sense it was tailored for his artistic personality. And he was engaged in art all the way through the time. Weirdly, the biography that I'm using as a main source it starts off this uh, section of his activity in the late 50s with an argument he had with a feminist art collective in the early 40s, uh, he, where he'd said, uh, kind of like when Christopher Hitchens got in trouble for saying women weren't funny, Vincent got in trouble for saying that uh, men were the greatest artists generally. Um, they were very unhappy about this. Um, if you want to read the arguments uh, put forward in uh, the book, his daughter cover, covers them with quite some um, extent and sympathy. I myself was not hugely persuaded by their arguments that, you don't know, some of those cave paintings, they could have been done by women. Yeah. 
Never mind. They they gave it a go. He was sympathetic though. He's he's a he's an amiable guy. Now what else was he doing? His reputation for art has grown even further. We talked about him being uh, leading a gallery, then trying to get a museum off the ground. He has kind of his um, I want to say like the peak of his art career at this time in 19, uh, 1958, he's asked to judge the, uh, do I have the next one? Yay. He is asked to be a judge on the 1958 Pittsburgh International Exhibition uh, organized by George Washburn. This is a major exhibit. He is on the panel judging alongside full-time artists, including Marcel Duchamp. Uh, some of you hate him. Some of you adore him. Uh, he is a chap who most infamously uh, put forward the fountain to a competition, which was a urinal that he had just bought and turned upside down. Absolutely amazing chutzpah. Um, they were judging a whole load of entries, including a Magritte. The Magritte did not win. I'm gutted. I tried to find out for you guys what Magritte was put forward and I could not find it. Gutted. But the point is, Vincent was feeling absolutely elated to be respected as an art expert at this point. If you've been listening to the series for a while, you know how important art was in his life. And now being able to ask uh, to judge a competition alongside artists, peak for him. Absolutely wonderful. Um, he also, following this, got asked to be uh, a member of a government committee taking a pe peppercorn wage uh, to help support and promote uh, artwork by American Indian artists. And he was absolutely chuffed to do that. Now, I'm not going to go into that much here because that's how we end up talking about Vincent Price for an hour instead of 40 minutes. I will move us on. Oh, Dr. Prepper. Is that, admi is that admiring Marcel Duchamp? Who knows? Who knows? You've got, you've got to admire it, haven't you? I'll move on. I'll talk about something else he was occupying himself with. Just an interesting footnote. From the 50s into the 60s, he was touring. This becomes very relevant. He was touring, giving talks on art, building up that reputation. Also touring, sometimes reading from Oscar Wilde's work, uh, dressing as Oscar Wilde. I went for this as an example just because I, I love how in character he is. Looks absolutely fantastic. Um, and he revived a bit of a tradition from good old Edgar Allan Poe himself. He would do Poe readings, also in character, long recitations of The Raven, and he would do these tours around colleges and elsewhere, attracting big audiences. And something that strikes me about this is when he's doing them, he's not living it up. He's not being put up in a fancy hotel He's going around doing these long tours, taking one suitcase with him with one change of clothes. He's washing his clothes in uh, the sink in the hotel overnight and and then just drying it for the next day and then just eating in regular restaurants. Even though this guy is in, you know, Hollywood movies, he's a well-known star. He will do these small personal tours. This is just a continuation of how down to earth Vincent tends to be. And I, I really like that example of that. Now, I said the this would be relevant, and it's mostly relevant because of the Poe connection. Because this, I think, is what really sold Vincent. He was not especially interested in being the horror guy. He had many interests. He wanted to be uh, in the art world, in the theatre world, and he also wanted to keep doing TV and film. But these two interesting chaps right here managed to sell him on taking a gamble with them. This is Samuel Z. Arkoff on the left and James Nicholson on the right. And they're the founders of American International Pictures. Uh, they founded it in 1954 and they were making small scale, very cheap um I guess you'd say drive-in fodder, B-movies to Z-movies, really low budget. They'll typically be pushed out in about 10 days. Um, and they're very much for cheapy genre audiences, basically. Teen films, 
Uh, I saved a couple of my favourite posters of their work for you. Uh, thought you might enjoy these. Um, yeah, Teenage Caveman is great. Beach Party, especially wonderful. I, I do gather that Vincent Price actually starred in Beach Party as a character called Big Daddy, uh, but I'm not going to subs. Uh, I'm not going to subject you to a clip of that. Anyway, they were doing these genre pictures and one of the main guys helping them get them out uh, as just these cheap double bills is Roger Corman, a young guy who is used to uh, just churning stuff out on a small budget, just making it work. And that he's exactly what this really small scale outfit needed. Now, Corman has done loads of these for AIP and he's getting a bit bored. He thinks that the... There's another way to go. He's seen how successful Hammer Horror has been. Uh, you know, their Curse of Frankenstein, massive hit. It was a higher quality production. It was quite daring and bloody for the time. And he thought, this is the way we need to go. So he suggested that they change their approach. And instead of making 10 day movies, they put more money into making a 15 day production. I know that doesn't sound lavish when we're all uh, Stanley Kubrick fans. Um, I think it was 14 months or 16 months he spent making The Shining um, when it was meant to be a 14 week production. So 15 days just, yes, it's still rushing it. But by Roger Corman standards, that is taking your time. That's marinating. And the other part of this is he thought they should try and get a bigger name on the picture. So... Inspired by Hammer, he says, let's go to Vincent Price. Let's do Edgar Allan Poe adaptations. And this involves Vincent Price taking a bit of a pay cut. This is a really small outfit. But I think what's sold is that Corman says they're going to do Edgar Allan Poe. They're going to give it focus. They're going to take it seriously. They're going to try and make a much more um, involved production that really tries to glorify Poe. And that's what interests Price. And the other thing that really sells him is that even though he's getting a lot less money, Roger Corman persuades him to take it in deferred payments, um, which one, makes the production cheaper, and two, it was sold as a kind of stability for Vincent. And I think Corman couldn't have known how persuasive that would be to him because fears over running out of work were constant in, in Vincent's life. He was a bit of a workaholic because he always feared running out of work, running out of money. And so the deferred payment really worked for him. You know, he, he would get stressed. He would, um, and when he was stressed, Vincent, I'm sorry to say, he could be rash. He could be cruel. If he was drinking a bit, he could be quite mean. You know, it's a bit grim. It comes out in the uh, biography sometimes. And a lot of that is the stress that he put himself under to be constantly producing and providing for his family. Um, so anyway, this collaboration, it had a lot going for it that worked for him. And this is where we get the really famous run. By the way, this is a, this is Corman on set with Vincent Price on their first production, The House of Usher. Sorry, The Fall of the House of Usher. Perhaps one of the uh, best known Poe adaptations. And I believe, you know, obviously Mike Flanagan has just given it a whole load new attention with his own signature style, which is very modernizing, very free and uh, liberal with its adaptation. I haven't seen it. I can't comment. I know a lot of people really like it. This one also has to be very free in adapting it because um, Poe stories, they're really short. I mean, they're ultimately going to end up adapting poems from Poe. So the dilemma was, how do you make a short story into a whole film? And to do this, they brought on Richard Matheson, uh, who many of you will be familiar of for, with from some of the works we covered on The Outer Limits and uh, I Am Legend, of course. Um, and Matheson kind of has free reign here to expand the story as much as he wants. So some of these... Um, adaptations get very liberal in how they connect to the material but nevertheless fall of the house of usher with vincent price's roderick usher is a massive 
hit. Absolutely massive. Um, Vincent Price was paid £50,000 for this. The whole budget was £270,000, sorry, dollars. Um, and it would go on to make $2 million over its summer, summer run. This is that classic thing, you know. Uh, yes, Dr. Prepper, absolutely. Richard Matheson, also great on The Twilight Zone. Many, many such cases. Um, now, sounds, one of the... Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I was going to say, what, what's, what, what, what would uh, $2 million be adjusted for inflation now? Do you... Did, did oh, you... I don't know. Do you, want, do you want to Google that quickly? Yeah, I'll have a quick Google. What, what year did it come? Was it 1960? Sorry. So it was say. 1960, the fall of the House of Usher came out. All right. Okay, cool, cool. And while you're looking that up, I'll say that um, as good as this is, by the way, um, one of the things that might have helped it is that it was in a double bill with a film by the name of Psycho. <laughs> so that might have helped. Might have, might have might have helped them along there. So yeah, um, great stuff, massive hit. And when that landed, AIP American International Productions knew they they had a format they could work. So instantly they go out into making another. It's another Poe film, The Pit and the Pendulum, and this is a start of what uh, would be sort of eight films. Price made with Roger Corman. Um, Six of which are genuine Poe adaptations and uh, some of which are, as we have covered on this channel, absolutely not Poe adaptations and absolutely taking the mickey, but never mind. Uh, TCG, did you have that um, figure? I do. Yeah, it's just shy of $21 million in today's money. That is not bad going. That is not bad at all. Oof, you love to see it. Yeah, so massive success. And this is the horror classic, isn't it? Tiny budget, huge box office. You can see why people start in horror. Ah, oh, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, we're following it up with a whole bunch of these. So Pit and the Pendulum, again, very little to work with. But this just leaves room for a lot more story. Uh, Richard Matheson uh, had a lot of fun bringing all sorts. Uh, Price plays a double role in it. Um, Barbara Steele will be fairly f uh, familiar to a lot of you. And I just, we're having Vincent in costume. Yeah, I just like a little few stills from him. They followed up uh, 1962, Tales of Terror. We covered this one, TCG. Now, oh, I remember this. This was good fun. This was, uh, this was, this was good. This was. Uh, I, th I reckon something they did here was um, this one was an anthology. I think yes. that's probably them re recognizing trying to adapt a tiny short story into a full movie. Mm, it's a bit right. of a stretch. So, yeah, they just did three short stories. Um, well, kind of four, actually, because the middle section, which is the most famous, is a combination of uh, a cask of Amontillado. Amontillado? And uh, the Black Cat. That also introduces an element of comedy. And the comedy is a hit. You'll also see alongside Vincent there, Basil Rathbone on the left. And Peter Laurie on the right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Peter Laurie stole the movie. Absolutely. They follow it up with a um, still in the horror cycle but not an ad adaptation of Poe. This is an oddity, Tower of London. Uh, this is actually a remake of a film that uh, Vincent Price was in when he was much younger, in 1939, when he was starring alongside Boris Karloff. Um, so interesting, he came back to the 1962 version. They then went back to Poe, and they decided, we're really going to emphasise a comedy on this one. They, they went loose with it. It was really improvisational. Peter Laurie especially, according to uh, the biography I have, really went off script quite a lot and really had a lot of fun doing that. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see that all that well on that poster. Your, your eyes are probably drawn to the big names. Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Um, but I if see you it. Look, do you see it? Yeah. The interesting cast list. Yeah. Any any 
Oh, I'm getting bullied over my pronunciation. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, Amontillado. I, I, I pronounced it English style. Okay, whoops. Okay, yep. Theremin Trees has got it. Jack Nicholson. Um, not actually the son of James Nicholson, founder of Arkoff. No, uh, the Jack Nicholson. Would, would you like a very young Jack Nicholson quickly? Go for it. Should we do it? All right, let's see if I... I am going to get absolute copyright nuked for this, but let's enjoy. I think I need to share that. Let's uh, let's have a bit of young Jack Nicholson. You guys are going to love this. What was that about your coachman before? Oh, well, uh, when he went out to the stable to prepare the coach, something happened to him. Absolutely classic. Father said that he was... <laughs> obviously the victim of some diabolical mind control. He might be looking calm. This what isn't the Jack I know. No. <laughs> He's warming up, folks. He's warming up. Like the He's going to slap ready. her, of course, isn't he? He's going to slap her, isn't he? <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. Um. <laughs> Is that before the Little Shop of Horrors? Oh, gosh, I don't know. So this is 1963. Um, I'll check it out. Let's know. It, it is a very early one. I mean, basically anyone who's anyone has worked with Roger Corman, just going in, learning, basically throwing yourself into a fast production, having to make the movie quickly, efficiently, cheaply. Everyone basically learns the tricks of the trade from him. Famously, uh, James Cameron uh, learned a, learned a lot directing alongside Corman as well. Uh, we we're getting a report that this is after Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, I thought I thought we'd all appreciate a little bit of early Jack Nicholson there. Um, but yeah, this is so. This is you know, as you'd expect. The Raven. It's a poem. This has basically nothing to do with the poem. It's a story about three sorcerers feuding with each other. Um, although we do get a nice bit of Hazel Court, who's a bit of, well, you'll see the appeal, basically. I have a few of these lovely stills from there. I just, his expression, absolutely fantastic. Ah, uh, there, we're getting it confirmed. Little Shop of Horrors, 1960. Still haven't seen it. I'm terrible. And working alongside Peter Laurie again. Great combination. So Laurie, Karloff, uh, Rathbone working together, having a fantastic time. Very different styles of acting. Laurie, much more loose. Karloff, much more classic. Uh, we're nearly through. We're on to uh, some of the last ones here. So Edgar Allan Poe's The Haunted Palace, which, uh, as we will remember from our coverage, is not an adaptation of an Edgar Allan Poe story at all, but they're doing the Poe cycle. They are trying to sell this as a part of the same series. It's only called The Haunted Palace because they slapped a bit of um, Edgar Allan Poe's poem at the start and the end. Otherwise, That's it's right. an, yeah, it's a Lovecraft adaptation. Absolutely scandalous. But what can you do? What can you do? We, we watched this. We enjoyed it. I'd like it a fair bit more than the reviews. Gosh, I'm mindful that I've got 15 minutes to finish this material. We'll get through it, guys. But here we're hitting the absolute big hitters. This is some of the best stuff. Um, Stelos, I don't know if you've seen this. Have you heard of this one? It's, I, has its reputation sort of spread? Um, I haven't, I must see. Ah, okay, okay. This would be, I mean, I th I'd say this is probably the classic, the best known one. I'm seeing a bit of love there for um who said they they really enjoyed Tomb of League. Oh John Garris. You like the follow-up to this. Very nice. Okay. Now this is a winner. It's again it's Poe, but it's branching out a bit. It's also I would say this is a one that's so confident. Now to do the Mask of the Red Death, they moved to England to start doing the production which meant they got access to a whole new range of classic sets. They could book studio time much cheaper. And as a result, the production looks much more expensive, much more grandiose. 
and it really has time to breathe. And I think that helps. They also had Nicholas Roeg coming on board to help, who would later make uh, Don't Look Now. And I think that really adds to the much more gothic styling of this. There are just, there are so many nice touches in this. Like um, one of the main resources I used for researching horror movies is um, Ivan Butler's Horror in the Cinema. Now this is a very old book, but it kind of runs out at anything in the 70s. But it's full of praise for this stuff, uh, for this era. Highlighting uh, little witty touches like um, you see a shot from inside a, um, a grandfather clock and you see the pendulum of the clock swinging as a, a sort of very clear tribute to the pit and the pendulum. It's all sorts of nice touches like that that make this an absolute winner. And there is a 2018 restoration of The Mask of Red Death, um, which I can highly recommend. I watched that. It's a beautiful restoration. John Garris is appreciating the X certificate. Yes, it's lovely to see an X, isn't it? They're going to be around for a fair bit longer. I think they stick around until 1982 when they're sadly phased out. And um, I was going to say something, but it will spoil the episode coming up on Saturday. So I will not say anything and we'll move on. I wasn't going to spoil the blockbuster episode three. No, don't know why you'd even suggest that. Uh, and we come to the final one in the Poe cycle, the Tomb of Ligeia. Again, a bit of a loose adaptation, but bringing in the classic Poe themes of burial, corpses uh, kept around, all that business. And Vincent Tri has a very different look in it, a very different styling. Oh, my. Yeah. Um, this gets reviewed very positively. I have not seen it myself. Um, I got the Vincent Price collection uh, or the that Shout Factory put out. It it has the house of full of the House of Usher, but it does not have Tomb of Ligeia. You can get that on the second one. But I'm very intrigued about that. Um, I hadn't heard of it much, but it, it does have a strong reputation in all my reviews. So I fancy it. But um, through working with AIP, um, it's not just a post cycle. As I said, they were kind of cranking these movies out. And the fact that they could get them done so quickly really appealed to Vincent. Um, because as I said, he's a workaholic. He wanted to be assured that he would always have stuff on the go. And while he was very invested in the work on the post cycle, he also did a lot more under contract to AIP that I think it's fair to say he wasn't as keen on. Um, some slightly cheap stuff, like I said, Beach Party, where he was playing Big Daddy. Um, he did other stuff that he didn't enjoy as much, but has gone on to have a great reputation. As um, we talked about, Richard Matheson was doing a lot of the writing, and so he was able to get his own story adapted. Uh, this is Last Man on Earth the first adaptation of I Am Legend. I really want to watch this. I really want to check it out. Um, it really appeals. You're getting a, a notably older Vincent there, I think. 1964, you're seeing it. I really yeah, want to he's starting he to look a bit aged. You know, so he's looking a bit aged now compared to someone mm -hmm. like the previous streams where you were covering his earlier life. You can really start to see it. How, how old would he have been here? So, so he was born in 1911. So he would be 53, 53, yeah. And also doing a lot of work. Now, um, the connection to how you described Horror State of the Goss was doing all this stuff, like um, remembering he has been basically pumping out, I think, 20 horror movies uh, since 1958 to 1964. He's doing loads and he's getting that reputation. And people asked him, how do you feel about this? Do you mind doing the horror? And he said that he views horror as something distinctly impossible, the supernatural, um, the sort of ghosts and so on. Whereas he thought that the real world threatening stuff is sort of, um, he talked about like real world violence, real world sexual violence. Um, and he, he described that as terror. So he drew the oh, distinction. Okay. Yeah. And I think 
uh, I think that really right that really works for me as well you know I can watch this stuff I can emotionally engage in the horror and view it very much as something that is artificial yes and it seemed he could do like just like you Vincent was doing the same thing so he, did he use these words horror and terror yeah yeah he did yeah. um it, it's kind of handy because Stephen King has um a similar thing where Stephen King talks about horror, which is, um, gosh, anticipation of something yes. awful. And then terror is when you're seeing it. Uh, it's very imminent. It's an imminent possibility of, of yeah. something awful. And then he talks about just shock, which is, you know, like someone's eyeball is put in a microwave or something. Um, yeah. And may I ask here, because... Uh, you have uh, obviously researched a lot of uh, Pry uh, Vincent Price and a lot of what he said about it. Would he say that uh, there is sometimes an element of psychosomatic shock in terror that is not present in horror? Psychosomatic shock. So that would be something you, um, just so to make sure I understand you, a psychosomatic would be something that you convince yourself of. Um, um not necessarily something that you see and it has an effect on you psychologically and physically. Mm. So, for instance, le let me just give you an example. I find some documentaries about actual wars and uh, also about some dictatorships to be psychosomatically stressful for me. I can oh. give you an example. It's called mm. Jackal, The Art of Killing. It's a mm. documentary about some of the executioners of the military junta in, in, the, in I think, Indonesia. And you have the same executioners mm. talking about what they did 50 years before and they haven't been persecuted. And a lot of people have said, including myself, that by watching that, you do have psychosomatic stress and you have a sort of uh, effect on you. But that's not present in horror. Ooh. That, that's a really interesting one. Um, so I want to say yes, because he draws that clear distinction and he avoids what he would call terror, aka sort of really relatable, believable horror. He avoids that. I think he finds it distasteful. But at the same time, he did engage in very realistic, what I would call horror, um, when he did stage plays, like um, when he launched it, it was Angel Street, but we know it as a film Gaslight, which is a very believable story of a, a husband basically sadistically terrorizing his wife, convincing her she's mad. I mean, I would say that's that's terror, basically. Um, and he was happy to engage with that. But um, so I think... But then uh, I suppose when he's on stage, you already have an element of artifice that helps make it a bit safer. So I'm not sure. I think he would see there as a distinction, and I think he would agree that the potential for psychosomatic harm or psychosomatic impact would be part of why he doesn't like to engage with it. I mean, from what I've seen, he, he always has a veneer of separation between reality and the horror he does. Um. The biographer I use says that he's quite camp in his horror, and I, I'm, I'm tempted to disagree with that, to be honest, because I don't think he ever... Oh, I think he rarely approaches it with a kind of ironic distance, but he, it's more like he uses a gothic heightened emotion that looks like camp but isn't. Also, I wanted to say hi to uh, Connor, who uh, <laughs> dropped in. <laughs> savage, absolutely savage. There's no respect, is there? By the way, good Tomlinson talks yesterday. I very much enjoyed that. That's the other thing you should check out if you're um, going over to Lotus Eaters. I also uh, should catch up with this. Rory Herbert, thank you so much for dropping two pounds and wishing everyone a happy Easter. God bless you too. Happy Easter, my dude. Yeah, much appreciated, Rory. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, it took me a while to get to that. Um so we're talking about sort of the branching out of different kinds of horrors um, and other 
interesting projects. I saved this one for you, TCG. Ooh. This is going to be the most concentrated dose of uh, Austin Powers you can get all night. <laughs> Have you ever heard oh, of Dr. My. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs? I have not, but my God, I am interested. Here we go. Oh, it, it's fantastic. It's it's a plan. So it's a sequel. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. And he's heck bent. <laughs> heck bent? Oh, heck. Really? Yes, of course. Of course. Keep it, keep it family friendly. Come on. Yes, this is the sequel to Go Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Meiji. Oh my god! Don't Why aren't we covering? Why aren't we covering machine. these films? Really, really, really? Oh dear! Well, Doctor Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, also American International Pictures, comes out in 1965. I was a bit more interested in the sequel because of how Austin Powers it is. They're they're literally fembots. They oh have god. bombs in their bellies, and oh. his plot is to send them in and uh, to seduce politicians and start world war two <laughs> or three sorry jess franco has apparently watched it what don't you like about it jess franco look at this how can you not love it look he's, oh, he's my pure days. hugh hefner <laughs> you can tell he's a man who's enjoying his job right now yeah oh i, I couldn't do it I, I just i saw this look at his damn face <laughs> it's so good <laughs> Ah, uh, fun times. Very fun times. All right, I will um I will try and find the thing that I need to read that brings us to the end of this chapter. Almost on time, almost on time. As we said, okay, maybe he does do a bit of camp, maybe. Maybe a tiny bit. I want to talk about another one. Um one of the later ones that he did in this period which is the comedy of terrors and this was again a collaboration under aip and i highlighted all the names of people he was working with because it's a bit darling seeing them all together once again basil rathbone peter laurie and boris karloff together this time just having fun with it Really enjoying playing up the comedy angle. And I highlight this because these guys were friends in real life. They loved working together. They had a great respect for each other. It was kind of... um. It was a joy that these films were bringing a very old generation of actors together. Like, Karloff was best known, obviously, for playing Frankenstein's monster in the 1931 Frankenstein and he was always grateful for it, even if he was kind of known for that one role. But for them to be, through these movies, connecting to a whole new generation of horror fans, this was something that Vincent was really delighted by. Um, but it's also the last film that he managed to do with Peter Laurie. I'm having to... Uh, the Gosh, the photo I've got here is a bit too large, so I've got to resize it. Let's go with that. It's the last time he managed to work with Peter Laurie because, unfortunately, uh, the poor chap did die oh. fairly soon after this. And I think I talked about this uh, when we did uh, Tales of Terror, that uh, Vincent Price read out the eulogy at Peter Laurie's funeral. Um, and I just thought I'd close off on a bit of that eulogy. So Vincent said that he was a great actor of another era, said of our calling that we are sculptors in snow. And yet at the final dissolution of this ephemeral image, the whole world mourns. Something irreplaceable has disappeared. But if there is immortality, surely it is in the remembrance of man. And what the actor creates is a lasting memory, however insubstantial, the material of which it is made. The memory of a great performer is elemental and the elements of life. Peter had no illusions about our profession. He loved to entertain, to be a face maker, as he said so often of our kind, but his was a face that registered the thoughts of his inquisitive mind and his receptive heart, and the audience, which was his world, loved him for glimpses he gave them of that heart and mind. The snow statue of his work perhaps will melt away, but the, sol Sorry. <laughs> but the solid substance of his self must last. 
And I thought that was a little bit lovely, a little bit uh, of an indication of Vincent as a very old fashioned chap, a, uh, a very artistic, aesthetic spirit. And I thought this was a nice way to close off his uh, work with uh, American International Pictures. They would provide him a path into his next stage where he would star in one of, I would say, the greatest horrors. And that would be, they would distribute it worldwide, but uh, it was a British production and that production was Witchfinder General. Oh, yes. what a film. Amazing. But we will discuss that next time. I have just about done this in 40 minutes. Basically kept scheduled. Thank you so much for that bit of, <laughs> of Vincent Price history. Yes. Uh, and now we should probably get on to discussing <laughs> the topic of the stream. Thank you so much if you came in <laughs> hoping to hear talk of Prince of Darkness. One hour in and now we will discuss that film. Gosh. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> One thing to say, because you mentioned um, Richard Matheson, who was involved in the screenplay, and he mm. also wrote I Am Legend. He has also written a very interesting novel, horror novel called uh, Hell House. I really oh. like it. You know, if people like horror novels, that's definitely one to check out. Hell House. Well, nice. Uh, I haven't read it. I have read I Am Legend, uh, and I have wanted to get a collection of his uh, short stories, but recommendation is welcome. I also saw chat recommending Richard Lehman. I don't know if you've... Uh, have you read any Richard Lehman, Stelios? Um, is it the new author who has written Fisherman? I'm Let's not see. sure. I, I remember him from a while ago. I, I read... Um, the one that sticks in my mind is One Rainy Night. Okay, okay. Maybe um, maybe I don't know him. I'll oh, have no to worries. check it. Never mind. Chat. Uh, well, you've you've got approval for Richard Lehman from me. Um, okay. I enjoyed it. I thought I thought Stephen King's cell was far too close to One Rainy Night. Uh, we have a question. Uh, was it adapted? Was uh, Richard Matheson's Hell House adapted to the film Hell House? I have no idea. Let me quickly check. We'll find out, Ramshack Lotta. We'll try and find that yeah. for you. Okay. Beat me to it. I was going to ask that question because I, I feel I feel like you've mentioned it before, horror show, or, or like at least in passing. I feel like that's 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 got to be the name a name of a horror film, even if it's yeah. not an adaptation. I know there's Hell House LLC. Which I've had recommended. Oh, of course, yeah. I can't remember if I've watched it. I think it might be a um, a found footage, but I, I could be wrong. I, I mean, think the maybe oh. The Legend of Hell House. Yes, a 1973 film, maybe. Yep. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it was adapted. Lovely. I haven't watched the, the, the movie, but they could definitely do a new adaptation as well. Oh, always welcome. Depends always on welcome. who does it. Yeah. That's oh, an excellent point. We have so many cases. <laughs> we have so many cases where, you know, you adapt it, you make it so different. You know, The Thing would be one that comes to mind. I don't know if I would like an adaptation of The Thing because I, it's definitely one of my favorite movies. Yeah. And I just don't want them to destroy it. That's oh. a, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like doing that with like Back to the Future, you know. I, I I'd be absolutely livid because I think I think the uh, the was it the nineteen eighties version was it nineteen eighty two the thing version. Um, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, that was fat. Like I I don't think you could top that by doing it today, especially in today's sort of climate. Um, yeah. And and the same could be said for for Back to the Future as well. I, I sort of put those sorts of films in that sort of bracket where don't touch it, leave it alone. You know, yes, it has they, they, so much artistic value that if yeah. people try to do anything with it, it will just destroy it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't seen the 1957 version of the thing, but I, I think you can get it on, uh, I think it's either Tubi or, or, or Pluto. 
Mm. Uh, I had been meaning to go and watch that because I remember we did a thing ages ago when you yeah. when you covered the, the Burning Man when he yes. when he got set on fire. That was that was brilliant. That's a great effect. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I like it where you guys are going with this. It, I think you can hit a level of like iconicness where you yeah you don't touch it. It's it's been done. No, you can't go near. But there's there's plenty where you can do a, a fairly major reworking and still get something good. I think I'd probably point to uh, you know Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, oh, and this recommendation has come up again. Um, yeah, this recommendation has come up from the era before. I think that's quite a good one. So do try and hunt that down. We love an audio book. I thought that was a really interesting uh, idea. I have a question because mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to movies like The Thing or like uh, Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness and, you know, movies like that, I think that when when they have such a cult following, let's say, or uh, people love them very much, mm. we're prone to forgive some mistakes, let's say, mm. that we find in movies. But I think that if there are extra sequels afterwards that they're definitely trying to treat the, these movies as cash cows we are not so much interested in forgiving any kind of mistakes that come afterwards i don't know if you think that this makes sense do, what do you think of this i mean when yeah. you talk about horror films and cash cows my mind immediately goes to films like halloween and <laughs> nightmare on elm street <laughs> and uh, the friday fr uh, franchise yeah. Uh, I'm I, I personally have a soft spot for them, and uh, I, I I do kind of mm. forgive them a lot. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'll be honest, um, but no, I, I do see yeah. where you come from. I think so, someone in the chat mentioned actually mm. they they talked about the the, the thing the, the 2011 uh, prequel that came out. That I, that would probably be a good example of what you're saying, because um, mm. <clears throat> I mean you know the, again you, you're following an, an an absolutely iconic film, and you, you've got to pay respect to the original material. And, and and like you say, not treat it as as a as just you know a quick cra a cash a cash grab, and it's got it's got to be done right if, if you if you are going to take that risk and go and, and and try and sort of add to something um, that you know has a lot of you know, ha almost like has a cultural impact. I mean, j again, just an example. It's not horror, but like the Star Wars franchise, for example. I mean. <laughs> If you look at the stuff that's come out re in recent years, it, 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 if if anything, I think it's damaged the the brand overall rather than mm -hmm. rather than added to it. I didn't watch the last one, and I know many people are uh, thinking that this is a horrible thing to state. But I lost interest after a while. I absolutely love the old ones. Yeah. Oh but yeah. I just yeah. didn't go to watch the last one. Yeah, I I was exactly the same. I've still not seen the last one. I, I remember watching the Last Jedi, and I was just that was yeah. it for me. That was yeah, it for exactly. Me. That's for me. Yeah, yeah I didn't go to watch the, the the same. Yeah, amazing. All all of us are just like, no, I'm done. I'm done. Um, as for the cash ins, yeah, I mean, ho horror is probably the genre where the cash in sequel affects the most. Um, I'm I'm torn on it. Almost always, it's not worth it. Um. There are very few cases where someone's gone back to the property to do something and they've done something very worthwhile. Um, and we get to a thing where we'll often say, like, oh, skip a sequel, you know. Um, I, actually, speak it because we're mm -hmm. going to speak about a John Carpet and film tonight. What do you think about the um, almost like the reboot of, of the Halloween franchise? Because, oh, you know, which one? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I mean, I mean, because obviously when Carpenter went back um, and, and and did Halloween, I think it was like 2018, I think it was. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, that that was essentially getting rid of, you know, that retconned pretty much the entire franchise. Everything from the Halloween uh, two onwards gone, you know, mm. no Josh Hartnett anymore. Sorry, proper horror show. Oh, um, you you know you've pinpointed my main problem with it. Yeah, <laughs> it was mine too. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, like so in in that sort of regard, you know, so someone who originally worked on the piece comes back and goes, "Yeah, I'm not happy with that. We're gonna reboot it and turn it into something different." But what are your thoughts on 
on that or in that specific franchise i should say um for halloween with the 2018 that david gordon green uh directed i think my problem with that was it it slightly relied on all the stuff all the canon that it had junked mm. um so that there was a kind of mental weight in your brain a sort of psychic weight to the confrontation between laurie and michael yeah but in the logic of that film Actually, all that had happened was Halloween 1, which yeah. really, there wasn't that much history there. So for her to go like full recluse um, and turn her entire life around and base it on being the Michael Hunter seemed completely irrational because all the, you know, however many films where she'd battled him had been stripped out. Yeah. So I felt it was a little bit sneaky, um, but I know I. I love it. Funnily enough, I, uh, Michael Myers <laughs> says zombies Halloween remakes were the worst. But yeah, I, I <laughs> were the worst ones. I I completely agree. I hate Rob Zombie yeah. films. I don't know, uh, Stelios. Do you have a take on the uh, Halloween reboots? Well, I don't remember the um, the last one. I watched it, but it's been years now. But uh, tell me if I'm wrong. It seemed to me that it didn't try to copy Carpenter, Carpenter style in the first one, did it? It um, obviously they were. It... Obviously, the, the 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 plot was the same. But would you say mm. the directing was the same? No, the directing was a bit different. Um, it did copy the pacing. Uh, it tried to copy that sort of a uh, slow amp up um yes. yeah well i didn't I, see I the final remember, one actually uh, i didn't see halloween ends yeah i don't remember the movie that uh, that well to give a good answer that it seemed to me that um, the director was adding something different in the mix at least with respect to directing style and i respect that because it's easy to just try and copy Carpenter when it comes to this mm. but it, I think it wouldn't work it's more honest let's say mm. even if the movie wasn't that great what, what, what do you think that's tough because it's you you want something to work with a previous world but then if it's so you also want a bit of originality don't you otherwise is it I can think of an analogy in music hmm for oh, instance. Go ahead. So, I mean, Queen is one of the biggest bands. Everyone knows Queen. And mm. uh, after Freddie Mercury died, there were lots of singers who were going to sing their songs and going on tour. And I think one of the singers who did a very good job was Paul Rogers from Bad Company, who had a very distinctive style of singing, and he didn't try to copy Freddie Mercury. And it was different, but it somehow worked. So mm. I think that, you know, remakes of this sort could, under conditions, work if the people who are doing them know that they, are bringing, that they have their distinct style and don't try to copy absolutely everything from the original material. Mm. Yeah, it, uh, it might be jarring. Sure or not, but... No, no, it's fine. I mean, I we've had discussions before about where different directors have been offered franchises and didn't do it. Like the classic example is David Lynch being offered Return of the Jedi. And I would want him to do it in his style. Yep. So, yeah, I guess we're, we're asking... We want the directors to do their own thing, really, and to bring their own flavor. Because otherwise, why would you have them do the uh, do the movie? Um, yeah, there has to be an element of involvement because otherwise, it's like having a DJ and giving them a list of songs you want them to play. Mm, true. It makes it a bit too much of a product, really. Whereas you do want the art, you do want the vision in there. Um, speaking of which, we should probably talk about Prince of Darkness. We've been accused of stalling. Please, <laughs> this that. isn't the go the Goosebump stream. We did talk about ninety minutes before we addressed Goosebumps. 
I think, we can't, I think, and I think overall we probably talked for that, about that film for about fifteen minutes. Yeah, I will just say that Connor is correct. Yes, um, there is some deep subversion going on in the new stuff. Um, oh, yeah. I did highlight in my review just little stuff, little stuff that they snuck in that you think, why did you have to do that? Why did you have to? Um, but yeah, guys, hunt down Connor's review there. Also, look up Connor's review of Last Night in Soho. That was very good. I think it's a different magazine, but look it up. And now, John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, one hour, 15, into the stream. Um, what we typically do is, if uh, people haven't seen it, we like to give them a brief recap of what happens. So... Um, Stelios, in about the time that it takes someone to pour a pint of Guinness, would you give people a brief synopsis of John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness so, so they can follow what we're talking about? Okay, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, cool, cool. Bishop finds a key to a church, and that priest is joined by a team of academics, mostly physicists, who try to understand what uh, happens within this church. While an eclipse approaches... People start behaving as if they're possessed and trapped. And uh, the sorry, sorry, can, can we start again? Absolutely, go ahead. Sorry, I, I completely lost my train of thinking. Maybe it, it's tough to do. Oh, Everyone hates possessed. doing the summary. It's all tough. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Basically, what happens is that we see a priest dying, and uh, someone finds out what he had. He had the chest with a key. That key opens a church that hid a liquid substance inside. And uh, he joins a team of academics who are trying to see what, who are trying to understand what this liquid substance is. And uh, they find out that it is sentient. They end up understanding that it is a liquid embodiment of Satan that is trying to summon the father of Satan, that is the anti God, to come and conquer the world. And I understand that it made the worst summary ever. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Not in the least. Not in the least. That's we'll get into the meat of it. But um, yeah. yeah, people, you'll be you'll be fine. Watch, watch, watch the film. If this is confusing, just watch the film. We're going to do a full spoiler analysis anyway, so don't worry about it. Yeah, that is uh, that that'll do. It's it's complex. This is not a film. I think this is very much John Carpenter trying to move away from what was big at the time. I think he wanted to try and really get away from slasher horror. Like he's an atypical guy, and I think a lot of his effort was to break free of that. Um, and so we have a film that's a fair bit harder to summarise uh, than Friday the 13th or Halloween. There are some deeper ideas going here. Um, if you could give me time to summarize it, the time that it takes you to pour two pints, I think I could do a better job. We we do sometimes have a literal video of Guinness being poured to, to help people out, but I think yeah. it, people tend to find it stressful to see the, the pint of Guinness because it speeds up at points, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Stelos, you, you asked me to uh, reserve this. I'm very happy to. So why would you, as a starting point, what, what is it about Prince of Darkness that um, that you thought that you'd really like to discuss? Well, I really like its theme. And I really like the way it explores cosmic horror. And uh, the main two themes I see in it have to do with our idea of our position in the universe. Mm. And um, also the other has to do with loss of innocence, that I have a, a weird approach to this because it seems to me that a lot of people don't talk about the couple in the movie hmm. between uh, Brian and Catherine because a lot of critics have said about this movie that it has no character development. I think that the, there is an element of truth in this, but... I think that it isn't so much supposed to be a bad character development as much as what characters symbolize. And it seems to me that if we look at what the character, the main character symbolize, we will see that 
Catherine's character is m more romantic and idealistic, and you could say a bit innocent, whereas Brian's character is much more practical and uh, focused on survival. And sh should I say what happens in the end, or uh, is it oh, a Oh, absolutely spoiler? no. Full spoilers. We do full spoiler analysis, so you can say absolutely everything. It's all good. Yeah, so, okay, so at the end... They and they cannot end up together because she's trapped in the other dimension with the antigod. We will say a bit how this happens, but I think that this is a major theme in the movie that we cannot save ourselves and survive by maintaining innocence. That's a theme I see in the movie that I mm. don't see many people picking up because a lot of critics of this movie have talked about the lack of character development I think that the, this is sort of missing the point. There is an element of truth into it, but there is also a something that is missing. And the other theme that I said in the beginning has to do with our position in the universe, our idea of a position in the universe, because we usually have the idea that somehow we're custodians of the earth and that mm. uh, the world is created in such a way that us humans have a very specific place in it. But uh, the movie tries to say that basically we're like ants. And we have Birak, who is the professor of physics, towards the end, showing uh, some ants to, uh, to Brian and Catherine and talking about them. And they say, well, they're individually unaware of the purpose that they serve. So maybe we're like ants. Yeah, so I think that. That's interesting. I, I wanted to pick you up on that because I saw there's lots of imagery of ants, of worms, uh, sort of amassing. Um, yeah. And if you you could take that as that's a Stephen King level three, it's a gross out, just ew worms. But I this is John Carpenter. I think there's something more going on. And your interpretation of the ants is sort of, they're there to represent our insignificance. That's why they're sort of uh, turning up. That's why we literally see someone decompose into insects. Um, exactly. And if I may yeah. add, oh, please. I think yeah. the way that uh, we are, the, the main idea, philosophically speaking, that Carpenter is dealing with in this movie is called the great chain of being that is the mm. hierarchical conception of the universe that is a conception of degrees of value that usually god is on top then we have angelic beings then we have humans then we have animals plants and minerals and this has been a philosophical ideal that has influenced the western world for at least since plato for, for centuries and uh, people talk about it without even understanding it. And we are definitely influenced by that idea. For instance, when someone is behaving very badly, we say how low you've descended to, mm. the depths at which people have descended to. So we do have this idea of a hierarchical conception of the universe that people who are, let's say, very immoral have a lower position than others. And what Carpenter is trying to do is trying to say that we are much closer to the earth, to the mm. lower scale that ants are, uh, than we like to think. I think that's the the main theme of the movie. Mm. I can see where you're coming from. Um, <clears throat> I think with when it comes, because obviously this this film is very uh, heavily sort of leaned on 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 science. And one of the things that you hear a lot from science is just how insignificant we are as a species. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, going from, you know, we're not the center of the universe to, you know, if there are other, you know, beings out there uh, in the universe, wherever, you know, higher intelligent forms of life, we, we, we probably don't really rank high in that chart. So I, I can sort of see where you're coming from. Yes. Mm. But there is also another element that has to do with um, how common sense isn't sufficient to understand the universe. Because 
the worms, for instance, appear on a window. That's one yeah. of the very weird scenes. And also the liquid, if you see when it's dripping, it's uh, defying gravity. It's mm. um, concentrating on the ceiling. Yeah, there was... Um... I don't know. I reckon they might they might have been boiled for 12 minutes in a, in a pan and thrown <laughs> against the window. Oh, no. Um, I, I kind of got with that, that Carpenter was doing something quite interesting because he's he's got a bit of a rebellious nature. He's a very anti-authoritarian guy. Yep. And what I thought was really interesting was, to me, he seemed to apply anti-authoritarianism to both the church and science. Um. And you're talking about this, uh, the great chain of being and sort of um, repositioning us in perspective of something even greater. Um, what he seemed to be saying a lot was just emphasizing how little we know. You get you get a very early speech from um, Victor Wong's professor at Stelios. I apologize. I never remember any character names. Uh, can, I will... I've, got a, I've got a brilliant name for him. And it's only because you mentioned the fact that he had Bell's palsy um, behind the scenes. Uh, with Mergu, um, because I, 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 when I, I, I did like I literally I wrote a few notes, nothing major, mm -hmm. and I was called because I'm like you, I'm terrible with names, and I was calling him Mr. Miyagi because obviously he's teaching. And, you oh, know, no. But then uh, I, I, I then changed it to Chinese Jim Ross. There's a WWE reference there. Oh, I, I called him Asian Forest Whitaker. <laughs> we are Vic, we are Victor Wong fans here. We appreciate him in uh, all his John Carpenter appearances, and he. Right. Was he in Tremors too, or have I just done a racism? Oh my god, I'd love it if he was. Uh, let's have a look. I've actually got the IMDb up. I'll pull up his. There we part. go. Oh um, my god, he was in Three in High Noon at. Oh god, where is it? It's gone now. But that's that's got Hulk Hogan in it. Uh, he was in yeah. Tremors, first one. Yay! There we go. See, um, I didn't do a racism yet. I'll get one in later. I promise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he starts giving this speech, uh, basically about. You think you know science, but you don't know it. We found out if we go to the subatomic level, there are things we don't understand. Yeah, I um, mean, he's just he's just explaining the theory of everything, really. There, how like uh, mm. general relativity and 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 quantum physics uh, don't line up when you get to a certain point. Like, so for example, you talk about the Big Bang. You know, you can get mm. you can get like ten to the power of thirty two seconds from the from the Big Bang. You can sort of make everything sort of work from there. But when you go back. It, it mm. all it all falls apart. That's what Steve, like the likes of Einstein, Stephen Hawking, uh, uh, you know, and, and the likes would, uh, have been trying to figure out, you know, since well, the you know, last sort mm. of century or so. Um, <clears throat> I I did find that it was quite interesting when they started talking about the dream sequences and how they <laughs> related that to, to to some sort of like message messaging system from an alien race that was traveling faster than light, and they oh, and they gosh. talked about tachyons. Yeah. Um, which is a hypothetical um, particle that, that can travel faster than, than, than light. But anybody who, who knows knows that anything with mass can't travel faster than light. Uh, so, and also, mate, and, and this is only because I've, I, it, I'm, I'm no scientist or anything like that. Everybody knows I'm, th I'm, I'm as thick as thieves, but I do like watching science videos and it was mm. recently i was watching a, a video from a channel called cool worlds um i'll link it in the chat in case anyone wants to 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 to, to watch it after this um but they talk about why faster than light uh travel at least to things like time paradoxes and one of them mm. that they talk about is is so there's an example of a supernova that happens and sort of like a t you know sort of the timeline that happens so earth earth sees the the um uh they, they they see the supernova they set they send a message off at light speed to planet vega to warn them about the supernova um and in between that there's a there's a light there's a, a ship that travels slower than, than than light speed and basically if they were able to emit a message faster than the speed of light to the ship and the ship says well hold on a minute will send a message back faster than than light um then t uh, to turn off their transmitter for whatever reason essentially what would happen is it would it would cause what's known as a grandfather paradox so like by the time the message gets back to earth 
the the message will actually arrive before Earth actually sees the supernova, which means they turn off the transmitter so they wouldn't see it, so they wouldn't send the message. But then if they didn't send the message, how would the ship send the message? It's it sounds okay. confusing, but yeah, think think the grandfather paradox that loads of people would should, should probably have heard about that. Mm. Um, it essentially works on the same principle. So I, I, I struggled. <laughs> I, I struggle to see how it would work from a sort of scientific approach. Um, kind of broke it a little bit for me, but that's only because I've been watching that stuff recently. But this is stuff that Stelios was talking about earlier on. These are things that you can forgive because it's a film. <laughs> Suspend your disbelief. It's all good. Yeah. There is a certain yeah. amount of that. Yeah. <laughs> I also didn't like how uh, Chinese Jim Ross was talking about how time is the same for everyone as well. Because again, time dilation. True. It's not. I I think what he was trying to get about was just that both science and religion have basically, they're full of unknowns, basically. They have their understanding upended. And that's why Carpenter has this thing where you have something behaving impossibly that has a history that basically says Christianity is, um, we have a completely different understanding of it. Um uh, so it it upends both their worldviews. They don't know how to encounter it. They don't know how to deal with it. Um, and like Stelio said, it really puts everyone into a place of insignificance um, where they have their certainties completely challenged. Yeah. I think the movie's not so much about the limits of our understanding because towards the end, they do understand what happens mm. i think it's much more of uh, in, about understanding our insignificance mm. and yeah i don't think that it's necessarily anti-science or anti-religion because on the one hand when we're talking about uh, literally satan and also <laughs> the father of satan there does seem to be a religious element into it so, and also yeah. what, what is, what a lot of people forget is that when they were deciphering the texts that the Brotherhood of Sleep was mm. um, keeping and trying to have the substance, because in my really bad summary, I didn't say that there was this brotherhood that was guarding this liquid and they had some texts, they were trying to decipher them. And it said yeah. that somehow that the father of Satan was locked and banished to the other side. So that mm. suggests that there was a kind of higher force that yeah. could do that before yeah. man. But, so, sorry. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, I agree. It was the, the, the Brotherhood of Sleep, was it? Great. Yes. Name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I, I'm not saying it, it, it is anti-science, anti-religion. It's more that it has a a challenge to the certainty. To common um, sense. I, common I, sense felt like, yeah. I, I felt like it was trying to combine the both, um, mm. rather, because, I mean, like, the, like um, again, you know, Loomis. I'm sorry, he, he was Loomis in this film. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he basically confirms that, the, you know, the Catholic Church essentially is just like one giant cover up because you know aliens made us <laughs> and um jesus and, yeah. An alien. yeah yeah jesus yeah jesus was a space was a space alien who, who came down and uh spread the word and yeah uh, uh you know, one of the more surprising elements did. in the film um but uh, the reason that's in there i thought was quite interesting and like this is classic carpenter because i think his influence here is really Lovecraft. Yes. Like, this is a classic, you know, this is a guy who would make uh, In the Mouth of Madness, which is basically about satirizing Stephen King and getting to the Lovecraftian strength that's underneath his work that uh, really um, makes it, that really provides so much of the, the value. And here he's doing it before, um, what would it be? Um, Let's see, 1994, so this would be seven years before that. I think he's drawing a lot on the Lovecraftian ideals, which is kind of a classic thing as the protagonist uncovers that their understanding of the world is very limited and there's 
a deeper, very ancient truth that kind of blows their mind. And this reminds me of that a lot, that they uncover something very harder to comprehend, maybe, a, a, and of course, a, um, a horror on the other side in a reality that's about to break through into our reality. That's pure Lovecraft. That's the whole um, Nyalathotep. Um, wait, am I getting that right? Is it Nyalathotep? I think so, yep. I'll take I'm, wait for it. I'm waiting for Mergut to correct me because it's whichever god, um, who's ever, whichever god is dreaming the dream we're in. Um, so I'll I'll wait to be corrected on that. But I thought that was a major influence for Carpenter here. There is another one that's kind of explicit. Um, if you notice the name of the author of this one, oh, there we go. Thank you, Azathoth. Thank you, Mergut. You had got it wrong. Darn it. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, the other big influence on this, if you notice the writer for this is one Martin Quatermass. Oh, I saw that name, yeah. I recognise yes. that from somewhere. Uh, you would. That That is a name that uh, John Carpenter has stolen from the Quatermass experiment and Quatermass <laughs> in the pit. This is, in fact, uh, yeah, this is John Carpenter again, doing his thing of writing under a pseudonym like he uh, did in They Live. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, the Quatermass experiment is uh, written by Nigel Neal, a British author, sci-fi author, very prolific. Uh, he had worked with Carpenter on Halloween 3, um, although Neil was very unhappy with the script, uh, ultimately and uh, unfortunately, but evidently the relations were not so sour that Carpenter wouldn't make a tribute to him here. I think the particular story that seems to be referenced a lot is the stone tapes, uh, looking in um, Kim Newman's Nightmare Movies. Is it Nightmare Movies or Nightmare Cinema? It's nightmare movies. He uh, references the stone tapes where there's a similar thing where people uh, encounter a sort of supernatural horrific mystery and they start trying to apply a scientific understanding to it. Um, and you read the plot of that and you can you can see the influence here on this. Sorry, I was info dumping on that quite a lot there. Apologies. <laughs> What you see regularly, both in The Myth of Madness and this, is uh, characters who are repeatedly talking about reality and common sense. And, mm -hmm. for instance, I remember in The Myth of Madness, there was Sam Neill's character in the hotel in mm -hmm. uh, that place where Sat Sata Kane was hiding, where he was knocking on some uh, wood and saying, that's reality. And uh, <laughs> also here we have uh, the character of Brian, also telling um, Catherine in the beginning that you know, some things change, some things don't change. Whatever you are telling me as a physicist about what happens at the subatomic particle, you no, know, some things don't change. That's why I was saying also he represents the more practical and survivalist element mm -hmm. of the group. Yeah, the, this. I mean, he's really interesting. I, I, the, one of the problems I have with this film is there are too many darn characters, but it's not like we don't get any development. Um, I think the main development is basically between, um, apologies, Victor Wong and Donald Pleasant. I never remember character names. And yeah, Brian and, no, it's Lisa is the actress, isn't it? Uh, sorry, who is the, I've got to remember the uh, character name. Catherine. I think it's called Catherine, and there Victor we go. Wong's yeah. character is uh, called Birak. There we go. Yeah. Excellent. I don't remember Apology. about uh, Donald Pleasant's character. I think they call him the bishop. I don't, he's I don't he's just. He, I think I think in the script he's just known as the as priest. Mm. Yes. Okay. The trip here earlier. There's something interesting about Brian in that he's constantly playing with playing cards, mm. and I, I thought I found that. You think possibilities? I, I thought he was showing maybe a bit of a kind of interest in sort of card manipulation and magic. Like it was sort of saying that 
he knows there is a an underlying logic to something which appears miraculous. Yeah, I think, well, if it, for, for me, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of felt more sort of probability based just purely because of the fact that they're talking, you know, there's a lot of science posting in this film. Mm. And when you get to sort of like the quantum sort of state, yeah. you're not really talking about specific, like, so for example, if they're talking about the, the location of a specific atom, you're not, you're not able to necessarily pinpoint where the atom will be, but you're able to, but it's more of a, a probability as, as to where that could be. Because again, when you break down, when you get into the quantum level, it, 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 it's, it's, it's crazy. Like essentially atoms can be anywhere and everywhere at the same, same point in time. Like one atom could be like in, in, in multiple places at once, but it's only once it becomes observed that it, that it gets a fixed, mm -hmm. a fixed, uh, a, a fixed position. Um, the, oh, there's a, there's an experiment uh, called the, oh, it's called the slip. Like the like the slit uh, two slit experiment mm. or something like that. So, um, you you fire like photons at at this at this like slits, and the expectation is they go through either one or uh, they either go through one slit on the left or one slit on the right. And when they're left unobserved, and you come back, uh, that, that's that's what happens. However, when you observe the experiment under the same conditions, but you're observing it, you find that the atoms will split and, and land in like five or six different places um which obviously is counter to 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 what you would you would expect oh sorry it's the other way around when they're not being observed they they land in like multiple places like five or six different areas but then when you do observe them it's either the left slit or the or the right slit um it's again it's it's, it's a, so what I'm kind of getting with it is like, you know, you're playing with a bunch of cards. What's the probability that you land on the three of hearts? You know, the, the card is there. It's in that pack. Mm. You know, it, it, it's going to be in one of 52 places. So what are the, what's the probability that you get that card? That's... There is a very dark element here in the movie, especially when it comes to the physics that underlie it, is because a lot of the traditional understanding or the more mechanistic understanding has to do with uh, their, the supposition that there is an objective reality that we just observe and the observation doesn't affect at all mm. what it is that we're seeing. Mm. But uh, the experiment you just mentioned suggests that observation affects 100%. What well, they mentioned, yeah, I mean, they uh, mentioned Schrodinger's cat as a, as a, uh, brief, briefly in in there, yeah. and they sort of talk about the, like the quantum suppositions and like you, you, mm. the cat. You know, okay, I'm not going to explain it because you know everyone knows what Schrodinger's cat is. But yeah, that's that's a really good point, uh, Stanislaus. And uh, the the point I want to raise is that uh, at some point Birek is talking to to the priest and he's saying, "What if this mind that is there in the universe?" that does the observation, let's say, is mm -hmm. actually anti-God. Like there is, for, for any particle, there is an anti-particle. Then for what we call God, there is an anti-God. Mm -hmm. And what if mm -hmm. the anti-God on the other side is very much malevolent and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Well, obviously, if it, if it is an anti-God, it will be malevolent. But, you know, there's a very interesting way in which um, the physics comes into it. But let me just say this, because... I think if we're talking about the physics, we are making things a bit more complex. What <laughs> is absolutely brilliant in the music, I won't say it's the music, and Every especially time. the way the way the music the way the movie begins, where you have this haunting synthesizer music, the uh, the moon and mm. uh, the last priest of the bishop of the Brotherhood of Sleep dying and um, the very not very fast but relatively fast bass guitar rhythm that's absolutely brilliant because it communicates the message that you know sinister forces are steadily moving in the dark mm. and I think that this is a brilliant way to begin the movie I don't know what you think mm. about it no, I thought I thought it was a good start I thought it was a good way to start the film Although I do have an issue with the key, because I because th the key, if I'm not mistaken, is 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 like the, the is the key to the to the to the pod that this creature is being held in. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> when they when they talk about it, because they, they later on in the film they're examining it, 
and they, they mention about the, the the locking mechanism that, that's holding whatever's in there in there and and they're saying that it can only be opened from the inside oh i i think the key is for the church oh the keys for the church uh, oh, okay. key, keys for the church don't worry okay, like that would have been weird um oh good because that but, that that yeah that, that threw me a little bit because i'm kind of like well to, i mean but even still like it's kind of weird that you would give that, that you would put the locking mechanism on the inside so effectively they gave this thing two thousand years to pick the lock so it was, of course it was only a matter of time before it was going to get out <laughs> yeah it's um how that works i'm not so sure but um yeah, the, the music as ever, the music's always going to be a highlight with Carpenter. Mm. You know, he's famous, uh, as we said, every time he does his own music. It's a standout. Um, I think him splitting up, I'm trying to think if he's done the splitting up the intro with titles before. Um, someone could try and tell me. I, I, it, in, the, in the trivia, this lasted nine minutes. Mm said well that's the classic uh carpenter thing is you take your time at the start and then you ramp up the pace uh afterwards um just setting up everything you need to see like you like you said so you're setting up dread um also drawing parallels i noticed so you saw the priest walking in a garden in a nice green space expressing his concern then you went to the university with them in a green space expressing their concern you're building up that sort of parallel connection that they're both going to have to face the same challenge and then you slowly bring those worlds together it's a it's very nicely done it's very patient and if he's actually taken nine minutes with it that that's gone quickly i remember yeah, it, thinking yeah. the pace I had problems with the pace the first time I watched this. Like I felt it hits a bit in the middle when everyone's barricaded themselves up in their rooms that they um that the pace kind of died a bit. But on the rewatch, it wasn't that bad actually. It worked was, for me. I was gonna say when because obviously I, I I caught your conversations with Mergu um in sort of like the uh sort of behind behind the scenes as uh, as we were building up to this and I, and I, I did see you say that you had that and you initially had a problem with the pacing, but I, I mm. don't really think I, I, I experienced that on my first watch. And, and I, and I have sort of, uh, sort of fir the first, sort of, sort of the second and third watch at least. Cause yeah, I, I've watched it three times now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, th with the first watch in particular, I, I didn't really notice the, that, 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 that there was a pacing issue. That, that was for me personally. I, that was ever just things in this film that sort of caught me. Um, which were like the again the science posting. You mentioned the moon. Um, mm. It was oh, a bit a bit annoying that they had different phases, which it, it, it didn't really seem to be a time lapse to equate for that. Like, so you 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 start you see the moon initially, and it's a crescent moon, and then the next bit it's a full moon. It's back to a crescent moon, and then it's back to a full moon again. And there's not really uh, I, there's not really a like a time lapse that would sort of justify that quick change in uh in in phases it feels like it's very much sort of like a uh, linear time we're going from the guy dies they very quickly get these people in these these 50 year old definitely not 20 year old students uh <laughs> with discount donald sutherland um in there it, yeah it, it didn't yeah these what, all forgive these things guys? these all yeah i mean the, the guy the the guy with the receding hairline i feel like is is who chris benoit would be if he never got into wrestling and uh didn't you know end his family's life and was still here today i, I feel like that's what he would look like today i don't know if i will sound as a too much of a Prince of Darkness apologist but it seems to me that towards the end where we have around 10 minutes where everyone is sort of alone and we think that nothing goes on. I think that there is actually something going on there and it has to do with um, the exploration of another theme that mm -hmm. has to do with loneliness because it seems to me that the priest was alone there, mm -hmm. was left alone with his faith, uh, with his, let's say, faith or shattered faith. 
and uh, the physicists were alone. And uh, there was the, I, I think, Walter uh, trapped yeah. in a closet. Everyone was sort of trapped. Yeah. And I think that, that was where it was sort of purposeful because there was, the, I think Carpenter was trying to show how lonely we ultimately are. And oh, I don't know great. if... Uh, yeah, that's doesn't really like that's, uh, reading too much into it. But no, I, 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 I completely. And in fact, it's interesting because every, every, just to expand on that a little bit, because every character, bar again Donald Sutherland discount and um, Catherine, they all have, they are kind of like isolated characters, aren't they? Whereas with 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 the other two, they have, they have that sort of, they they start off single, they come together. And at the end of the film, they're li quite literally torn apart from each other. And yeah. you, you get that, you, you then get that, that fresh sense of loneliness through both. Um, I don't want to keep calling him Donald. Uh, what was his name? He's just credited as Priest, unfortunately. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about um, Donald Sutherland discount. Oh, Brian. Brian. Brian, yes. Yeah, you've got that newly, um, that, that new sense of loneliness again through through Brian from, from the loss. And then of course you have uh, Lisa at the end credits, who's replaced the original sort of apparition from the, the, the dreams that um, the, uh, yeah, the transmission the will have him. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great point, man. That's, yeah. that's a great shout. Well, sticky on this. You, you talked about, uh, Stella, you talked about at the start, how Lisa, sorry, uh, Catherine and Brian, they actually, they do have a more substantial journey. They have the difficulty of bonding. They're a bit prickly at the start. They're sort of talking from different corners. Brian has, to, he tries a compliment that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> uh, if there's one yeah. thing I learned from this movie is that chicks dig sexism. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you, you throw it out and then it doesn't work. You know, you can, um, you can rewind. And she was cool, but... There was that difficulty communicating, but they did want to. They did manage to get over it. They and yeah, and they went. And they went yeah, and they hit it off pretty soon. She is going to spill that tea, and that really upset yeah. me. That really yeah, upset yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, yeah, but there's a bit where I. I he seemed to be wanting to express quite a lot of emotion, like he's been watching her for a good while. Um, yeah. I would say that's cute. That's maybe not something that the film had given us enough to sort of support. When she, yeah. he sort of, the implication is that he wants to express his love and she's saying, don't do it let, yet, yet. Let's wait and see if we can get a uh, another one um, or see, see if this happens again. I felt maybe that, was a little bit rushed, even if it was quite nice. Yes. Um, but yeah, the theme of trying to connect and people ending up in different places, separated, shattered and lonely. Yeah, that's definitely throughout the movie. And towards the end where he is trying to sort of enter the mirror, I think we, we need to say a bit that uh, the mirror was a was functioned at, functioned as a sort of gateway to the other dimension yeah, when the possessed yeah, yeah. Kelly was summoning the father of Satan, saying father, I think. Uh, yeah, well, there's I, something and, quite... Oh, I'm sorry, Stelios, please. No, I just wanted to say that uh, at the end of the day, Catherine was uh, trapped in the other dimension mm. and... Um, Brian woke up and he sort of tried to enter the mirror to recapture her. And I think that there is yet another symbolic element here that it represents trying to, that, that if we lose our innocence, trying to recapture it is likely to expose us to even more danger. So I think that's one element that is... Um, a theme in the movie that, and it's a part of why these two characters cannot end up together. Hmm. 
Well, I, maybe I, I'm I, reading too much into it, but you no, know, we we you, like a deep read. I was, like was going to say, in in terms of over analysis and reading very deep into in, into themes, this yeah. is uh, what the I think what the progressives call a safe space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was going to say mirrors are really obviously key to this, not just in the plot way. But you notice something. If we're taking your idea, Stelios, of the sort of loss of innocence, that is really helped by the mirrors. So yeah. once people are possessed, they can't look at themselves. Uh, like this this guy, bless him, uh, who I think, by the way, this guy was just a great performance. So unnerving. Um, yeah. I really like this guy. This character is colder. Oh, by the way, this guy, uh, his name is Jesse Peterson. And uh, he is our Star Trek The Next Generation connection, if you're wondering. Uh, we do have to do this every week. He has been in uh, TNG. I know you're all hoping me to uh, look that up. And by the way, uh, a lot of them were in Murder, She Wrote as well, if you're keeping track. Anyway. Ah, uh, yes. Um, the, fam the famous ser serial killer, Jessica Fletcher. She's always there, man. She's always there. Anyway, after they're possessed, these people cannot look at themselves in the mirror. He's fascinated, but absolutely um, unable to cope. He covers his eyes uh, when he's in front of the mirror, sort of drawn to it, but unable to uh, look away. Um, then lately, uh, sorry, shorter afterwards, you get our possessed friend whose name I have forgotten. Has anyone got? I think her name was Kelly. Kelly, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you see her fixated but horrified by a mirror initially as well. And I think if yeah. we're talking about loss of innocence, that's in there. It's the inability to sort of um, view oneself, to view one's condition is there. And if and if we're talking about opposites, um, like anti-gods and whatnot, this this was mm. very sort of, this was a very kind of like anti-Christ sort of birth mm. you know because she spends part of the film unconscious and and up the and up the hillary and then uh yeah yeah you a sort of immaculate conception there's also you know she's uh she's white blonde blue eyed so she is your sort of classic innocence um if you will and therefore you know it's more it's stronger when she is corrupted mm. um also i found it quite interesting this is a 1987 film. It's coming out the same year as Hellraiser. And I just ah, thought, look at the, okay. the, the, these effects, I think. They really yeah, made some, me think Hellraiser. Yeah, there was some there was some good um is it I, I suppose body horror would be the right term for this again. Hmm. Sorry for dead air there. I don't know if we're oh have it I was been like muted? The, no, 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 you're still here. Sorry. Oh, hang on a minute. Chloe? Oh, I think she's going. <laughs> One thing to say about the effects is that uh, look at, looking at them from a contemporary perspective, they don't seem that good. But for me, this adds value to the, to the, the movie. Oh, mate, honestly, we, we do love the old practical effects. In these films, yeah. I think you know you you you, you can't you, you can't beat it. I mean, we we've covered some some proper gems, um, and again, just sort of bring it up as an example. But uh, the thing as well, you know, from a practical effects perspective, yes. that, you know, that was wonderfully done. And yeah, there's some really good moments in this. It's like when the guy's outside. Um, I can't remember his name now, but he's he's outside and uh, he's like, it's, it's almost like he's talking with like an underwater voice, isn't he? And he's like, I've got yes. a message for you, but you won't like it. And then he, you know, he delivers the message uh, and yes. then like his like head falls off and then his hands fall off. And yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. That, that was absolutely brilliant. And especially in the thing and in uh, Prince of Darkness, there, there is a sort of slimy, sense yeah things. yeah well it, again it's, it's yeah it sort of ties back to the old uh creature in the pod i also quite like the like the way that they possessed the other the, the other the, uh, the other characters like this this yeah. jet stream of like <laughs> like this goo although there was there was one uh bit where 
I mean, it's it's almost quite um, sexual in a way. Where where I think it's the first woman who gets possessed. She goes into the that that room with the other um, uh, the other woman. She's sleeping, and she sort of like slowly, almost like seductively, crawls on, on the bed on top of her, and then. I love it because the 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 I don't know if she is actually Chinese or not, but she she uh, sort of is is looking at her like uh, okay, and then just out of nowhere, bah, it just happens. Um, yeah, you're, you're talking about the theologian who was trying to interpret the text. Yes, yes. yes. What was yeah. her name? Let me just see if I can. I, I don't remember the name, but there Lisa. was a very horrific scene true. where she was typing, and she was obviously. Obs- uh, possessed and she was typing and uh someone looked at the screen and it said yeah. I, live, I live i live i live yeah constantly god that's almost that's almost uh there was AIS. a very weird element there also a very weird sentence because it said that you're going to die you're not going to be saved yeah and it also said you're not going to be saved by your god plutonium yeah I thought that um, was very weird yeah, John John Gorris mentioned that in the chat. He 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 mentioned that particular quote, and I mean, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about having sort of a Lovecraftian theme. That that's not brought up again at all in the film. Like, who who is this plutonium? The, the, the focus is purely on the anti god element, and we don't even know who that is, um, which is very sort of in theme with with Lovecraft in that you don't really see the big bad monster and you know you don't you, you know extremely little about it so yeah that that did add to it um just to let you guys know in the chat it looks like uh, horror shows internet connection dropped so she is trying to get back in hopefully we will have her back very soon um yes so um i think that basically this movie has huge rewatchability there mm. is something really good about its atmosphere. And I think uh, with um, many of Carpenter's uh, films, it's sort of easy to rewatch them. I don't know if you have the same feeling. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I think yeah. with, with, with the thing about Carpenter films, I think he he, he tends to have more hits than, than flops. Um, I mean, again, you know, Halloween, um, Oh god, what was the other one? The one he did with that uh, vamp- uh, was it vampire? Oh, god, I can't remember the bloody name of it now, but it had. Uh, uh, I, I don't Jesus remember Christ. the name yeah. of this one. I'm but- sure the guys in the chat will help me out here, but we we, we covered it on the channel, funnily enough. But yeah, he 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 does some really good, consistent filmmaking, and um, I, I I think you know again with the the, the things that are sort of like picked at are very sort of forgivable things i mean especially when you when you're trying to sort of make a science when, when you're sort of trying to bring science fiction in into the horror film um yeah. you can you can forgive it because i mean like obviously if, if you couldn't then how could you watch things like star trek or star wars you know yeah. um so yeah i think uh, oh there you go yeah vampires it was it was vampires um but yeah i think I, I do, I do think that yeah, this this film has, has definitely got rewatchability, and and I think about I love about these chats as well is you know it opens up perspectives that I wouldn't really be sort of aware of. Um, so yeah, some of the things that you've mentioned, man, are just yeah, I could go back and watch this with a completely different out uh, perspective now. I see a good comment from the chat from Lewis from Ulasnar who says that basically the plutonium may refer to nukes. So it may be a sort of psychological warfare that the anti-god and Satan are waging on human beings. And they say that you can nuke your way out of this. Ah. Maybe that's an element. One thing I want to say, because um, when it comes to Carpenter's movies, I think there is almost always an element of claustrophobia and there are an element of people who are trapped somewhere. So, for instance, you had in in Assault in Precinct 13 or uh, in The Thing or in here, Prince of Darkness. There is almost always a an intense feeling of claustrophobia of people who are really trapped somewhere and really don't understand what how they're going to do, uh, how they're going to get away uh, out of yeah. the problems that they're dealing with. And yeah. At the end of the day, it seems to me that it's more chance than anything else. 
Because, for instance, the way they get saved towards the end is with what happened with a mirror. So for people who don't remember it, what happened was that the possessed character, Kelly, was at that point a vessel of Satan. And Satan mm -hmm. tried to find a big mirror in order to open a portal to the other side to summon the father of Satan. And uh, there was a big mirror that she went in front of and put her, his, her hand in. And uh, there we see another hand, the anti-God hand, touching Kelly's hand and slowly and steadily coming to, to our side. Mm -hmm. And we see Catherine's character just rushing in and throwing Kelly's character within the other side. And then the priest throws the axe and it destroys, it shatters the, the mirror. And mm. at the end of the day, you couldn't know that this would work. Oh, yeah, it was complete, you, yeah. It was, it was, it was yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Um, you, you sort of mentioned them as well, about sort of like the claustrophobic elements um, that, that Carpenter brings. I mean, I, a classic example, of course, is, is, is Halloween 1, where you've got Laurie Strode and she's stuck in the, in, 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 in the closet there. Um, what did you think about uh, the, oh, what was his name again? I'm sorry, uh, Walter, was it Dennis Dunn's character? He was, uh, I, he was the comic effect, I think, in this film. Yeah, he was a comic effect. So I, I will say his character was a bit annoying because yeah, he was tr he seems to me that he never took anything seriously. Yeah, he always felt he had to deliver a quote or something, and he just wasn't paying attention to what was going on. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I did I did find it funny when he turned when he when he turned around when he was locked in the uh, like, was it, I think it was it was it the confessions in the closet. Yeah. In the closet, yeah. And he sort of turns around. He's like, you know, I don't mind you normally being dominated by women, but uh <laughs> like, okay, that was that was funny. But then like yeah. he burst out a random joke at one point. Um I think yeah, to the theologian. he said that yeah. uh you could pass for an Asian. Yeah, that's then right. don't worry, you 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 don't pass yeah. like an Asian. There was something weird there. Yeah. Yeah, it was almost a, yeah, almost like a callback, but it, it felt really odd because you know, it's a really I, you know, if I was in that position, the last thing I'd want to do is crack one-liners um, and 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 sort of like make light of the situation. And it, it, it yeah, it, it doesn't it, help. It, it didn't. It, it doesn't it, help. It, it, that didn't work for me. I think if we're talking about um, if we're talking about character growth, he perhaps could have been a good a good candidate for something along those lines uh, for, for something like that. Um, where you know he's he's just cracking jokes, not taking the situation seriously, uh, and then all of a sudden he gets that like moment of clarity, and he's like, uh, "Yeah, okay, this is a uh, this is this this is real." Um, so that was a perhaps one of yeah. the weaker characters in in the film. Um, and, and yeah, John, that's that's a good point. Making lame jokes is is how some people cope, but it just it, it just felt yeah. a little bit out of place, you know. I think if he wasn't in that situation specifically where he was in, I think uh, you know if he was just like with the group, I think you know yeah that that could work. But just in that moment where like literally you're you're you're, <laughs> you're, you're about you know you're for all you know you're about to die, you 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 might take it a little bit more seriously. I don't know. Yes. So um, it seems to me that. Uh... Proper horror show has uh, been banished to the other side. I don't know how she can. <laughs> she, be, she reached can through the mirror, didn't she? Someone, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, wh what do you think of um, Alice Cooper's presence in the movie? I see you have Alice Cooper on your, <laughs> yeah. on your um, I was, I was quite surprised to, to to find out that he was in it. I mean, it was only a small part. Um, I think they credited him as uh, what was it, schizo? Hang on a minute. Oh, what was it? Street Schizo. Street <laughs> Schizo. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah he, he, he didn't really do much in the film, really. I mean, he just sort of... I mean, he did kill that one guy, uh, the, the first death, with um, with that bike prop, which uh, I found out um, through the IMDb stuff, uh, is that it was actually his own bike prop that he that he sometimes used on stage. So that was, yeah. that was quite cool. And he also uh, did one of the songs as well for the movie, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and it was heard when he killed someone. So there was a, 
a lot there were a lot of researchers who were pissed off with what was going on because they were re literally kept in the dark. Birak mm -hmm. and the priest weren't telling them actually what was going on because they were afraid that they would leave. And they tried to keep them there because if they literally came across and tell them, we literally think that there is Satan here and we are dealing with Satan, maybe the response wouldn't be ideal in terms of... Yeah, what yeah, they yeah. Wanted to be. So uh, the, the first one, the first researcher leaves and he finds Alice Cooper on an alley and Alice Cooper is just killing him with a bicycle that has been cut in the middle. And yeah. that's when the song... Um, Prince of Darkness is uh, playing that I think he wrote. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, the, the the homeless people though in this film kind of uh, it was a bit odd for me because mm. if you remember at the end of the film, um, yeah, I've heard this criticism. I want to I want to see what do you think about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I it, it, it's odd for me because I I know I know that the, the the characters in the film that are possessed inside the building have obviously died and are essentially reanimated and I, I i assumed that that would have been the same for the homeless people as well like i would have expected them to just drop dead after uh, after the um the, the the threat was gone but they they don't they just sort of turn around and walk off as if n nothing had happened well what was, yeah um, that's, i don't know what to make of it I, i've heard this criticism that it says that it is uh, very weird that and sort of looking down upon homeless people. But I don't know to what extent that's that's a fair criticism of Carpenter because, I mean, you could say that the, the whole premise of the movie is that there is this liquid there that exerts a kind of influence that is increasing the mm. more time goes by. And we see when it comes to the beginning especially, Everyone is looking at the moon. Everyone is looking at how people behave. Things are rapidly deteriorating. So you would expect that the closer people are to the liquid, the greater the chances of possession are going to be. But at the end of the day, you could say you could also make the argument that, well, why doesn't that affect the researchers who are closer to the liquid for an X amount of time? while yeah. they're they're researching it i don't know yeah i mean another thing another thing that yeah. i suppose could possibly explain it and wholesome uh, wife wife who does sort of touch upon it she beat me to it was in the film they mentioned that the ooze or you know whatever um is able to sort of manipulate and control insects and, and and bugs pretty easy easily but when it comes to sort of more complex organisms like humans it needs more power um but the fact that it's able to control you know the the you know the the homeless people who i think kelly just um assumes are schizophrenic um because she 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 mentions that she's watching observing them and they're not behaving as, as yes. how she would expect yeah. them to work it almost suggests that perhaps they're not seen on that same level i mean essentially i mean especially because everybody inside the building you know is 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 somewhat in you know is is highly intellectual you know uh, definitely have a good uh, understanding of things like physics and whatnot and then yeah you've got the homeless people outside that you know just there <laughs> you know they're not yes. the, the dregs of society if you will yeah i see so maybe ben the homeless are possessed by Satan based question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, just, yeah, gently benevolent. Uh, you're, you're back. You see Uncle TCG has kidnapped proper two. Yep. I have now chucked her in the basement um, and I am taking over ownership of this channel. So yeah, sorry. Uh, was... The next blockbuster review is going to come from me. I'm afraid. <laughs> what was really haunting was the fact that, the homeless uh, zombies let's say they were <laughs> they, they weren't attacking the building they were no, locking right, the yeah. others inside yeah that's something that is a bit otherworldly and almost every scene with uh, homeless people w was an otherworldly scene i think that's a very interesting thing here because we have many scenes where you know we have the 
the people around the building that they display characteristically inhuman behavior. Mm. So friends just standing still, all of them just doing yeah. nothing. And uh, that was very unsettling. And especially yeah. there's a there's a scene with uh, Wyndham, one of the other researchers who leaves, and yes. uh, yeah. the one who became the body of cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. Yes, time, but oh, he that became the bo- that that was, that was a great uh, scene. But before he, that, this happened, he was outside and. Uh, he literally said uh, all of what we are being told by Birak and the other researchers is basically BS it's and uh, I'm leaving. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he said, I'm leaving. And, and he, he looked at people and they were just all lined up and mm. a door opened and it was Susan, the first one who got possessed. Yeah. And then someone started... Uh, Attacked Wyndham with a pair of scissors, with the scissors. Yeah, I think was that's the, the same. Sorry. So no, I was gonna say, was that the same homeless person? I think it was the same hobo that attacked, uh, not didn't attack, but but greeted the priest at the at the church. Remember when um, she, she sort of like comes up to him and and it's like a really sort of deep voice as well. You know, like I'm so pleased that you're reopening the church and then like you know she's holding a can of beans or whatever and it's got like loads of maggots inside it <laughs> he's just yeah. like Ugh. <laughs> i think it's that same one but yeah oh mate that death that 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 that, that kill scene oh love that, it that was very weird mm. that was very weird because he, he could see mud flesh and worms mm. i don't know if that, there was a message there that you know basically that's where you end up human beings yeah. that's where we end up we're just consumed by maggots, and it's also the other thing that uh, we come from dust, and to dust we will end. I was just thinking, earth to earth, ash. yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. So, the circle of life, if you will. Um, oh, I was, was going to say something, uh, and in the beginning, we were saying with the uh, proper horror show that there was a scene where Carpenter was very much influenced by Dario Argento. And okay. the scene I had in mind was the scene where um, someone attacked Wyndham with a scissor, and we mm. just see the scissor still and yeah. all the background moving. I think that was the the scene I had in mind. Where that yeah, I, I reminded I, me of Argento. I, yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, with with the sort of the limited. Uh, uh, Argento sort of films that we've. I mean, it's it's only the films that I've I've seen through through the reviews on this channel that I've that I'm familiar with it. But yeah, I I can I can definitely I can definitely see that where that inspiration has has come into come into life. What do you think of the criticism of the church in the movie? Because you see that when they're trying to decipher the text, ooh, proper horror hey. show is back. Hello, everyone. Back in your cage. <laughs> Welcome back to the other side. Ah, uh, well, that was that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew I music. should. I, I knew I shouldn't have fitted that lock to only be open from the inside. Damn it! Oh gosh, there's a problem, you know. But oh, I felt you reaching out, reaching out for me. I just, yeah, you you pulled me back in, guys. You pulled me back in. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that was an absolute Brilliant. nightmare. I just yeeted from um, Streamyard. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, please, please do carry on. Um, I lost internet for a while. Were you, what were you talking about? No, we were talking about uh, right now. We were talking about the <laughs> scene with Dario Argento influence. I was saying I don't know if you listened to this because I saw you were on the chat, but I was saying that um, there was a very good this scene. One? Yeah. Yes, this that one. Yeah, oh, with Wyndham who was saying that he's about to leave. He doesn't believe what, what uh, they tell him and uh, we see all people lined up as zombies and uh, we see just the scissor that is still and the background that is moving in the uh, that and the, then he is being chopped off i think oh, that yeah. was the scene i had in mind yeah is it's, that it's what that, he did absolutely yeah. it's that sudden rush um yeah. Where the that you have the stillness and then sudden intense close up motion is so Argento. Uh, 
Uh, I'm thinking especially Suspiria when the blind man is killed in that big open square. Michael Myers yeah. has just commented that, oh, as you said. Michael that. Myers, <laughs> on you, you know, we're so in tune. Oh. I see a good uh, comment by Kent Jensen says, that's a gorgeous still frame. Mm. Yeah. A lot of this is, uh, a lot of this really is just an absolutely gorgeous film, I think. Mm. Stylistically, it is one of Carpenter's best. Um, I mean, when you were talking about the great chain of being stuff, I thought of this shot, which just, you've got perspective there beautifully. But, um, yeah. yeah, sorry, I'll the go back to the little the... Argento frame uh, that was so cool. No, but speaking of the frame you just uh, showed us, before, we said also that there was a very powerful and unsettling scene when the Donald Pleasant's character was trying to enter the church. Mm. Not trying. He, he was trying to, he, to go and meet the researchers who had already walked in. He was stopped by a homeless lady who said, uh, thank you, priest, for, open the, for opening the church. Mm. And uh, kissed his hand, and he saw a cup with uh, dust, maggots, and flesh. That was oh, really yeah. unsettling, yeah. Sort of like a message that that's where human beings will end up. Mm. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of this? I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't looked at it in that way. And also... One of the interesting stuff about the movie that I found both funny and also really, it, I think it worked, was with the worms on the window mm. and also the liquid on the ceiling. So you would have some scenes that you would say defy common sense physics in a way you wouldn't expect them. But yep. uh, they surprisingly worked, especially given the fact that the whole scene was created, and uh, we were communicated the message that we were communicated the message that common sense doesn't make sense of reality <laughs> sufficiently. Yeah, you were set up for that quite nicely. Um, at the same time, there is a good, there's a a good amount of say earthly logic in there. I'm thinking yeah. particularly of um, this scene. Um, yeah. And what I mean by earthly logic is Donald Pleasance sees, uh, sees her trying to reach through and he finds an axe and runs forward, chops her hand off, and then the hand regrows and yeah. then chops her head off and then the head, uh, she just puts her head on. And I like that sort of, how can I say? Even if it didn't do anything, I love that he tried it. Yes. Troubleshooting. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it seems that uh, it at the end of the day, it was more like chance. We were saying when you mm. were at the other side, banished, we were mm. saying that uh, he didn't have any idea that this was going to work. He just threw an axe. He tried to do whatever possible, and it just happened to work. Mm. Yeah, he, he had to do something, but I, I guess it was ultimately the, the message was a sacrifice is what was needed. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like we were back to probabilities at that point. What are the chances that this will work? Let's give it a go and find out. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is derailing, but, uh, you know, we talk about massive reaches. <laughs> Yeah. Do we? Occasionally. It's come up once or twice. We've not done um, a gay reading yet. We've got the rare gay reading that I absolutely reject. Someone did try it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, someone said, so this is John Kenneth Muir, who has written quite a lot on horror. Uh, his books tend to be a bit expensive for me. Um, they're low, like low volume, so they go for about 90 quid, uh, some of them. Wow. But yes, he, he had the idea that uh, this was talking about the sort of horror of the spread of AIDS. <laughs> because, it you know, it's an evil. It's almost exclusively transmitted via a liquid, you know. 
and uh, you know uh, that in that transmission quite a few times it's in a sexual context you know uh, when this woman who looks a heck of a lot like Linda Blair tries it on with Lisa oh, and we, then we immediately this, after yeah. you know yeah, uh, I am not going with this reading. Incidentally, I just I found it interesting that in the Wikipedia they went out of their way to say that this is an interpretation of the film. Oh, this bit was weird when she started kissing him, and it you know normally um, obviously there was project like there was obviously like projectile stuff, but mm. was it just me or did it sound like when she was like tonguing him, it sounded almost like a sucking motion, like like sucking through a straw? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it was almost like it was the other way around. I didn't hear it. I mean, I found it odd that uh, Lisa got the stuff vomited onto her, mm. and then he's he's the only one that seems to get the full Frenching. Yeah, it was. I don't know. D did you have any thoughts about a slight sexual con like? I I am not going with the gay reading for once. It's a sort of in joke on the channel that I will often make one up for a laugh, but. Um, when someone's already done a bad gay reading, I don't need to. Um, but I, I was wondering, did you had you addressed a slight sexual vibe to what oh happens? Oh my god! Yeah, absolutely. I, I I definitely think there was there was a definite sexual undertone to it. Um, but whether it was to comment on the spread of AIDS, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I I lean to no. I I lean to no. Yeah, I've that, heard that, that people who. Sorry, sorry, TCG. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that was a warmer than room temperature take from whoever said that. <laughs> I'm not I've saying read... all of John Kenneth Muir's stuff is bad. I have not read much of it. I'm interested in some of his books, but I, I want to say that was a bit of a weak one. Bit of a weak one there. I've heard that uh, the people who make the gay interpretation of the movie say also that the character of Walter was trapped in a closet. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I that annoyed me. <laughs> yeah, and he he was uh, there trapped in a closet, and other people were uh, looking at uh, him. The um, two possessed ladies were looking at him, and he he was there. He couldn't get out, and uh, he sort of got out of the closet when there was real threat to his life. Yeah, um, I don't know if you're going to go there as well, Stelios, but I was going to say, I look, again, I love a silly gay reading, but this reminded me not of being in the closet. This this reminded me of the confession booth. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big closet. Yeah, I mean, I, ju I just thought this was very much set up to be like he was in a confessional. Yes, and like he's being confronted with his sins, and he's trying to joke it off. Um, yes, I did catch a little bit of you chatting about poor Dennis Dunn is basically wisecracking throughout this bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was right, but it, I say I just I just didn't feel like it was it was it was fitting at that moment. Mm. You know? Bursting out jokes and being like, "Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Lisa. You you, you don't look like an Asian." It's just like. That did crack me up, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's it's not that it wasn't funny; it was, but it was just kind of like it. It just the, the the tone wasn't right at that moment. Do you know what I mean? If if he was, I don't mm. know, if he was having like a direct fight, you know, like how Spider Man will, will, will crack jokes as he's fighting Kingpin or whatever. You know, if he was having a a one on one battle with Lisa, and you know, if he cracked mm. that, I, 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 I that that would be fine. But it, yeah, I don't remember if he made jokes at that time. I think he made them more in the beginning and the middle. Yeah, oh no, he, he he. I'm sure he said it when he was when he was trapped at that time. He's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. I didn't mean to call you." Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I think I, he I did crack remember. one or two. I mean, yeah. in this scene, I think Carpenter did lose. He's jug because of all the characters. I think he was juggling quite a few balls and. In the edit, there's some Phrasing. bits that come off a bit wee. There's some things that come off a little bit clunky, like the idea to break through the wall. Um, you have quite they try it and then they seem to stop working on that. And then when it becomes urgent, when um Kelly sort of awakens yeah. in a sort of full 
I suppose it would actually, in this film's logic, it would actually be full satanic. Um, when she awakens in full satanic mode um, and starts cracking the door, suddenly he gets another sense of urgency. Mm. And I did sort of think, like, that was your priority. You, you should have been working on that constantly, right? Exactly, exactly. It's a minor error, It's uh, but it was something mm. that kind of, it stood out to me while while I was watching this because this was a segment where I felt it did drop the pace a lot more. Okay, yeah. Maybe, yeah, it wasn't one of the best scenes. I think that when it came there to, to that, that um, segment of the movie, it was very interesting that the priest was alone. Mm. I would tell you, well, he's the only one with a sort of strong religious perspective. I, I suppose... Apart from Calder, the black scientist, um, yes. who you see wearing a cross and I think taking things a bit seriously, but then... Yeah, um, he, his character was very unsettling because he got possessed and then he started walking up the staircase, singing Amazing Grace and then slashing mm. his throat and then carrying on laughing while being visibly in pain. So that was... That was uh, very unsettling. I don't know what uh, the message behind this is. What, what do you think? I can take a shot at it if uh, TCG. Uh, I've got one. nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing. I just yeah. it just it right. was creepy as heck, man. In incredibly creepy. Uh, incredibly beautifully acted. I'm just there. We go. I've got it here. Um, oh, jeez, Louise. I mean, it's it's just so intense. Okay, so my take on this. Um, Calder is both a scientist and religious, so he's one of the guys who's actually firmly in the middle. Not that the camps are massively at war with each other in this film, which is itself very refreshing. Um, but he's the most blended perspective. He reacts quite strongly to uh, the liquid that they see and takes it seriously from the off. He's very spooked by it. So when he's corrupted, he feels it more than anything. And that's why he has such a strong um, reaction to it. That's why he wants to self um, self delete in this scene in quite a wretched way, um, a visceral, desperate way, because he's, he views it as sin more than anything. Um, he really grasps the scale of the evil. Now he comes up the stairs singing um, Amazing Grace because it's a song of emancipation. He wants to be uh, saved from this corruption. Um, well, but at the same time... Oh, sorry, please, no, please. No, no, that, that's an interesting way to look at it. But I don't know if there, there was a mistake there because all other characters who got possessed... They had a very blank zombie-like stare mm. and they didn't show any sign that they were sort of in trying to emancipate themselves from the possessing force. Yeah, he very much is, I believe, um, which is why he, he, and he wants to die. He tries to die like the, uh, you know, the um, schlubby um, engineer guy in the, sorry, physicist in the Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> Like he yeah. he's killed, but he comes back. This is part of that thing of we don't know the definites, we don't know realities. Like alive and dead are not definite states because that reality, as we think we understand it, is breaking down. So yes. he tries to off himself to free himself. He wants to go to heaven, which is why he's focusing on singing Amazing Grace. He wants to be emancipated from the evil, but unfortunately, in this scenario. He just gets brought back, and that's slavery why. Allegory. Ends... Sorry, slavery allegory. Yeah, yeah. He he is at the most moment. He he does not have free will. He is enslaved. So, um, I think that's why he ends up more than anyone in front of the mirror, kind of horrified at himself because mm. he has a much stronger reaction to the possession than anyone else. Uh, that that was my take on it. Hmm. What else about it? I, I wanted to 
I, I, I'll remember it. Yeah. Give me a moment. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to directing, what I really liked was that a lot of the times you had the camera wasn't moving that much. Mm. Yeah. And I really scary. like that when it happens. And I got this from this movie, and it sort of gives you a feeling that you're sort of there, especially when, for instance, it, the camera shows the hallway, and it doesn't move, and it shows you a person just walking down the hallway. I found it particularly in, good in this movie. Yeah, no, it, a lack of quick cuts to release tension just keeps you quite grounded. It's yeah. it's a carpenter staple, I think. Yeah, mm. I was gonna say. I think now nowadays, again, if if you try to make this movie today, I think it would be a lot more sort of freehand camera movement. Um, well, I mean, I suppose it depends on on the person making the film, but especially with like modern horror, there's there's there's. I, I feel like there's 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 a, a set of tropes that that tend to be followed um, because studios these days sort of lack any originality. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's quite. If if this was a sort of a staple of Carpenter, then it's quite it's quite good to see that 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 part of his fingerprint is is imprinted on this film. I, I again I I thought the shots were beautiful. I thought um the camera work was good. Yeah, I I agree. It gave you a great sense of dread. Um it, yeah. especially mm -hmm. in the not just the corridor scenes inside, but the sort of alleyway scenes outside. As um Theremin Tree said, yeah, Carpenter loves corridor shots. He loves that sense of claustrophobia. He used them in They Live. Mm. He uses them extensively in Assault on Precinct 13. And here, he really loved inside the building and outside the use of the corridor or the alley to get someone feeling trapped. And when they yeah. first try and get out and they're surrounded by vagrants on both sides, that's incredibly tense. Like, yeah, I found that really unsettling. Yeah, this is what Stelios and I were talking about while you were oh, while okay. you were stuck in the cage. While I was you um, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know that 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 that, that was that was another element of uh, in, entrapment as well, where you have these homeless people because you know Stelios mentioned, you know, they're not actually breaking in to mm. the uh, into the building, but they're they're keeping them enclosed in mm. that space, and yeah, like the, you know the you know it's it's an old derelict building essentially and it's you know narrow hallways and it's dark it's claustrophobic it, it adds to the tension it adds to the atmosphere you know keep them confined in there and don't, don't let them don't let them out in the open mm. good it was good 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 uh good of them to do that another Absolutely. interesting question would be what is the position of this movie in the Apocalypse trilogy? Because Carpenter said that, for instance, there was a trilogy between when it came to three movies. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, obviously that's a pleonasm. But he said that The Thing, The Prince of Darkness, and the In the Math of Madness are parts of a trilogy. And uh, it's interesting to explore what sort of uh, differences and commonalities there are between these movies. But... The way I think of it was that something you can see is that the thing is about a threat from, from space. Prince of Darkness is about a threat from another dimension, but you also have uh, some themes from space when it comes to revisionism in history and saying that you know, Jesus was an alien. And, yeah, uh, space Jesus. <laughs> yeah, space Jesus. And then in the Math of Madness seems to be only about another dimension without a mention of space. So it seems to me that Prince of Darkness has elements both from space and other dimensions. Yeah, it's, I mean, they're thematically linked, obviously, rather than typical trilogy. That's uh, maybe too obvious to say, but I, yeah, I could see it as a bridge. I almost, or the thing is a sort of a very physical external threat um, versus, I would say, the Prince of Darkness is a lot more conceptual, existential threat. 
And then you get down to uh, In the Mouth of Badness, which is almost postmodern. It's almost about your understand your whole conception of reality. But, um, yeah. The line I love from that so much is, uh, I forget her name, the woman, and reality female lead woman. character. Sorry, what? In, in, in the Mouth of Badness? She, oh, sorry, when, I thought we were talking about this film. Yeah, it's when they're in the car and she's having mm. a debate with Sam about uh, whether someone's insane or not. And she says, uh, sane and insane are only matters of perspective. Uh, and if the majority of people changed, then what is sane would change too. And it, oof, I love that too. So it's like a whole conceptual flip. I don't know if that works as an answer for you, Stelios. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're all incredible. The thing is the most typical apocalyptic ending. Um, yes. Whereas I think both of Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness are very unusual apocalypses in that they're, yeah. they're just not really, not as much physical threats. But what is particularly interesting about In the Math of Madness is that it's a bit postmodern, as you said, and self-referential, mm. but it's not over the top. That, that's what I particularly like about movies that are a bit self-referential and postmodern, that when they're not over the top. But if you see, for instance, movies like Deadpool, that he mm. constantly tells you every Every fifth second, I'm in a movie, I'm in a movie, I'm in a movie. That that That's not nice. I think it's trying too hard. But uh, In the Math of Madness was, I think, just brilliant. It As manages to keep you caring. You know. Trail. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a thing of, um, once, they, once they've acknowledged they're in a movie, how do you keep them caring? How do you still right. invest in them? That's yes. the challenge that I think In the Math of Madness does very well. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's part of the Apocalypse trilogy. It's, I'd say, probably Adventure, it's the least loved, maybe? It's, uh, Prince of Darkness. Yeah, I, I, I might be wrong. I mean, The Thing is obviously everyone's favourite. Yeah. And I... I think In the Mouth of Madness has been getting a bit more attention, whereas this is maybe the sort of least loved of the lot. Would you Would you agree? I felt this way, but um, the more I watch them, I prefer. I may prefer Prince of Darkness to to In the Mouth of Madness, but it's a very close. It's a very close tie. But it's just by a very small margin. Yeah, I'd, for a I'd long have... time I was I, I thought that in the math of madness is unquestionably better than Prince of Darkness. Now I'm not so sure. Yeah, I, I think for me I'd have to go back and rewatch it. I, I really can't remember too much from the film. Um, but yeah, for it to be considered better than this, I, I would say I'd say it's quite a quite a high bar. Mm. There's. I tend to like Carpenter films the more I see them. Like the pacing problems that I th I thought were in this film, just I didn't feel when I was watching it this time. Things moved yeah. so much quicker and the atmosphere was working for me a lot more. And just subtleties of this around some of the um some of the final payoffs I think are great. Not just this um the build up and having the patience to only show you a little bit of the threat, knowing what they can't show you is, is yes. very patient. But and instead leading instead, like the most horrific thing for me is, is this, it's Catherine being dragged away. Like, yes, this is horrible. This is nightmare fuel. Yes. That's what absolutely stuck with me. And then of course they got in, I think one of the most famous jump scares of all time. Which is sort of underselling it, but Brian in the bed afterwards, the absolute, it's such a brutal scare. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But what you said before, I think is absolutely key to evaluating this movie. 
that there is an element of minimalism into it. So, for instance, when it comes to the father of Satan, we just see a hand. We see there is a sort of concealed thing about it. Mm. And I think that works brilliantly because if we compare with uh, other movies, some of them very contemporary, like Insidious. Uh, have you watched the first Insidious? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I think it was very good, but when they showed the demon at the end, yeah, it, it just it just became a comedy. Yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 yeah that that film completely enraged anticlimactic. Me. Yeah, that so film I think enraged that it me. works. It works very well when there is a sort of minimalistic buildup of evil, because at the end of the day, evil is a symbol. The more you show it, the less powerful its depiction is going to be mm. Mm. and he definitely learned that lesson for in the mouth of madness yeah. now, there are lovecraftian hordes of creatures in that film but they're kept in the shadow you do not see them a lot and you end up then just how can i say um david lynch has a good thing about how closure is the last thing you want to give people because once you give people closure and you satisfy them they're kind of done with the story yeah. and they can put it away. Whereas if you keep you keep them hungry and they will want to return over and over again. And I think the lesson was learned uh, by Carpenter for In the Mouth of Madness. And certainly for this as well, the, the way Brian reaches out to the mirror but never touches it. Mm. We cut away like that is a very good choice. Yeah. In just sort of denying you sort of the excessive closure that you might expect. And he is sort of trying to risk evil and destruction just for love. I, I see a kind of parallel there. Yeah. What, what do you think? Because he, he knows what happened, but he he misses her and he wants her back. But he can have her, I think. No. Yeah, it, this sort of this sort of calls back to what you were saying earlier on about the theme being loneliness. I say that this this is a guy who gets over that, um, gets over that hurdle by by connecting with somebody and then mm. and then losing them in such a tragic way. Yeah, I, I think his loneliness is probably the one that that is perhaps the most hard hitting of all, without obviously knowing the the circumstances for everybody else, but. As as the audience member, we we've seen we've seen that trauma leading up to where he is now, and the effect that it's having on him. There's a bit of a parallel, isn't there, between um, how can I say? The anti god is this locked away being that's just seeking to get out, just seeking to connect, mm. and yeah. It's it's touching this impulse, like it's the Pandora's box thing. It's, you know, Catherine's had this horrible th fate. They only just connected. He's got this love for her. He knows he shouldn't, but it's that temptation to reach out. Mm. You can't and contain we're... these impulses. And I think we may be tempted to say that there is just chaos about to erupt, mm. but Another unsettling angle into the conversation is that there is a statement at some point by Birak, Victor Wong's character, who said there is order, but it's not what we would like it to be. Mm. So at the end of the day, there is yet another parallel of maybe the universe is such that it's malevolently geared against us mm. rather than just indifferent. And there being perhaps no way to really fight against it. I mean, we yeah. throughout the film, we get the cuttings of the message of something out looking in the church. And then in the end, we see more that it's changed. And now it's Catherine coming out of the church. Yeah. And this is something that's meant to be from the future being played back to us. This, I guess, this idea of it's this fate you can't escape. That order is maybe effectively a control. It's a control on you. 
Mm. And so Brian isn't going to be able to resist and he is probably going to end up re-unleashing that evil. Yeah. Or at least there is no way that the threat could ever be entirely dealt with. That's another theme. Oh, no. No, of course not. I mean, trapped in a church for uh, several decades, it's good going, but ultimately, yeah. ultimately, uh, I know, chaos reigns, right? <laughs> <laughs> you only need a tiny bit of a breakdown in order. Um, or rather, o order is very hard to maintain, <laughs> you know. Anyway, um, I try and keep these... Um, at about two and a half hours, uh, getting absolutely yeeted by StreamYard was not helpful. It has uh, <laughs> pushed it out a little bit. Well, I'm going to try and stay on the good side of our timings. Um, was there anything else, Deos, that you really wanted to cover about this movie? Because I, I don't want to cut you off if there was something you really wanted to... Um, oh, I, th uh, to I think I got enough time to talk about it. I Yeah. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, TCG, anything? Uh, not for me, no. Oh, actually, yeah. Uh, 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 Alasnar did make a good point. Why was Satan waiting seven million years to escape? Yeah, because that's why they carbon dated the uh, the cage to seven million years, and he was only it was oh, but he was only overseen for two thousand years. Mm. I'm guessing. I'll forgive that as well. I'm guessing it just takes a while. You know, it's you can you can have the most perfect plan, but you know, chaos has mm -hmm. a way. <laughs> so. You, it may take seven mi million well, years, but ultimately order will break down. And that, that is could be it, Alisna. That is what the that is what the universe is leading to. Entropy, ladies and gentlemen. Mm, alas, alas. Well, thank you so much. Well, at this point in the stream, uh, we we usually then uh, do our scores, our closing thoughts. We like to give the somewhat arbitrary out of twelve. You know, it. It's kind of an irony. We will talk about something in depth for a couple of hours and then we'll we'll just round it down to a, a score out of 12 burgers. <laughs> so, um, you know, I like to feel we're multifaceted here. Uh, so, chat, if you want to start sending your scores in, that'd be much appreciated. And um, I'll go to TCG. Would you like to do your closing thoughts and scores on Prince of Darkness? Yeah, I think it was a good film. Um, as I say, it, it, it did a lot of science posting, um, which was questionable. But as I said, while you were in the cage, um, you know, you, you can forgive it because obviously it's trying to tell a story using science. And at the end of the day, if you can't get through that, then how could you watch films like Star Wars or Star Trek? Because, mm. you know, it's all it's it's just a science fiction element. That's fine. Uh, I love the practical effects in this movie. Um, mm. The. The, the the one that stood out for me particularly was the was the guy the second guy who died outside um after delivering his little message uh, proceeded to just fall apart which was mm. amazing um alice seeing alice cooper in it was, was quite a nice little surprise uh I was not expecting that um and i <laughs> and just from a personal note i like how the gooey cylinder reminded me of zordon from power rangers i don't know <laughs> why but i just you know it just did um i would probably give it out of 12 burgers i'm gonna give it a solid eight um it, it looks a lot like the burger i had this evening for dinner um a big old quarter pounder with some cheese plenty of blood uh as well but there were no insects or creepy crawlies and definitely no worms uh thrown up against my window a very respectable score. Very respectable. How about you, Stelios? Uh, closing thoughts and score? I think I would give it a 9 out of 12 because I have a soft spot for this uh, movie. I think That's 9 out of 12 sounds uh, good for me. Yeah, and it sounds like it's something that's grown on you quite a lot, I think. Yeah. So they've... Yeah, 9 is it's firm, firmly in the recommendation zone. Um, yeah, All definitely right. recommend this movie. I'm I'm seeing people bouncing around seven seven to ten, not bad. So overall, pretty popular. I'm very happy to see it myself. Yeah. Um, I think this is one that you don't go for straight away, but it grows on you. Rewatching, you 
you start to know what to focus on, the pacing issues pick up and the few scares that are in there really land, especially the stuff in the alleyways. Um, it has some oddities. It has some flaws, but this is still very solid original carpenter drawing from interesting material. Again, using Lovecraft to power some uh, some more original horror than you were seeing at the time. Very much a reaction to the slasher craze and doing something a lot more memorable. And also packing in an absolutely fantastic ending that really powers a rewatch. So, oh, Mima getting in there. <laughs> Mima. Hey, Mima. Hey, Mima. Um, hey, Mima. Oh, I just started. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, you missed the drama <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Um, actually, just Gosh. before you finish off, I just want to mention uh -huh. that, guys, if you haven't seen this film, uh, we can't link it because YouTube don't like this particular site, but mm. you can find it on uh, BitChute. So. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, if you got this far in, you know everything that happens in the movie, but uh, hopefully you, you want to feel the atmosphere yourself. As for a score, um, I, yeah, I lean to a nine. I, I would want deeper, more consistent character work, but there are characters I care about in it. I, mm. I did find, um, oh gosh, we said their names enough, Birak and uh, Donald, uh, Donald Pleasance's priest, their interaction I found quite interesting, quite atypical. Uh, Brian and Catherine, you can connect to that. And I thought also, um, we probably haven't said enough about how good Walter and Calder were as characters. Um, just keeping it interesting. So it's a win. So a strong nine. Oh, and we've got a late one from the Henry Abbott. Uh, also a nine. Yep. I think that's coming out appreciated. <laughs> Ho hopefully, you know, it's it doesn't tend to be anyone's favourite carpenter, but I hope, hope we've made a good case for it. Um, and it was really good discussing this. Now, uh, as for your horror homework next week, um, April could be difficult schedule-wise for me. We're going to try and go ahead with the horror anthologies, picking that up again. But there may be some late last-minute substitutions. Um, so bear in mind, uh, I will get the horror anthology homework announced as soon as possible. We are very much catching up to the present day, and I think we'll be ending up covering Black Mirror this time. But uh, I will get the confirmation for you. Um, as soon as possible, but April will be back to horror anthologies. Um, and remembering uh, Saturday, you're going to get part three of the blockbuster history series, Rental Breakdown, and the commentary for The Shining, which I'm going to try as a live uh, premiere. So hopefully that is interesting. Uh, question coming in from Devonte: Any plans for the 150th video stream? I realise that is coming up. I'm going to have to think of something. I think we'll all have to do it topless. Oh. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> How come? Why is it me yeeted? Gosh darn it. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> we'll think of something. Checker 222. I'm glad you liked it. Glad you liked it. All right. We'll think of something good for that. Well, folks, uh, you've had a long discussion of Prince of Darkness You've had your scores and you have a promise of horror homework. Back to anthologies. <laughs> um, so it leaves me at this point to round off the stream. Thank you so much, Stelios and TCG. Thank you for oh, thank having you. me on the show. Yeah, pleasure as oh, always. Absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to chatting more films with you, Stelios, and hopefully I'll be able to stay for the whole stream even. That'll be a luxury. <laughs> Bless you. Thanks so much for carrying on, guys. And uh, chat, thank you ever so much. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Um, remember, links to TCG and Celios's, uh socials are in the description, and I would encourage you to follow them. So thank you ever so much, and I'll sign up now. Thanks, y'all. Cheese. <laughs>